Hi, everybody. Um, I've done something terrible. I, I've I've come to apologize in advance uh, for what you're about to see. I've spent way too long on it, um, and uh, we'll we'll get to the normal festivities later. But I just want to quickly show you my shame, and then we will move on. I hope that is okay. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. You'd love to see it. Hell yeah. I'm so see worried. It. Okay, let's get right to it. Let's find out who Chris this is. Oh, there you are. Hey, Neon. Good morning. Yo. Well, did you come through <laughs> for me and bring back what I asked you to? I didn't bring back crap. I was at a freaking funeral. Yeah, come on. <laughs> It'll be great. Sure, if I'm free. Yo. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. <laughs> Eating lunch together is so much fun, so much fun. I like it. Hey, uh, isn't it professional protocol to ask somebody before you take their picture? That was a horrible crime. I found the most awesome thing ever, the Kenta doll. Are you talking about that gigantic plastic doll they had standing in front of that fried chicken place? I want to take him home with me. <laughs> well, it's just trash. Katie's going to help me free my treasure. <laughs> then I can take him home and have him all to myself. Go! <laughs> Hey, Rena, has something bad ever taken place in this garbage dump? I don't know. <laughs> you suck. <laughs> Way to go. You didn't really stick it to him this time. I love Rika's voice actor. For the <laughs> He's very funny. The curse of Oyashiro? What's that about? I like using poison to kill. I have to use the bathroom. <laughs> Don't we all, Rika? Gagey, my bar. She's so sweet. Yeah, that's me. Oh, that's her. Who are you? My car's got air conditioning. We found Mr. Tomitaki's oh, body on the shoulder of the road. Very dead. Hinamizawa. The Okinomiya. Very dead? What? Is that the goal? Satako? We brought you <laughs> Satako? That Satako? That Mion's grandma made. Cool. Ah, go home! Go home! Go home! Go home! Go home! Get out of here! I like food that makes me bleed. Being late for class is for <laughs> losers. <laughs> it is for losers. He's so right. Rest is important. Mion? Look at you! You look fine! I'm never gonna worry about you again. <laughs> Inamizawa? Are you there? Answer me! <sighs> On a long walk, even the dog gets tired. <laughs> Ronald, as in President Ronald Reagan. Cry too much and you'll get attacked by bees. <gasps> Good medicine. Ooh, wait, was that actually in there? <laughs> Got it! Go to work? What the hell are you talking about? I still feel like a dumbass. <laughs> 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 I, for one, am hoping that no one is going to give your officers any trouble at all this year. Now that makes two of us, young lady. <laughs> is that guy a cop? They found Mr. Thank you. <laughs> I think he's probably just lost, like I can be sometimes. Lost? That sounds great! Yes, I want to take you home! A cat? Yep, a kitty cat. They go meow meow like this. That girl is cursed. <laughs> I said that girl is cursed. <laughs> Satoko Hojo is a cursed little girl who's been stained by Oyashiro's curse. Did you know the village leader had hemorrhoids? If you're up to it, I can show you all <laughs> my crimes. Uh, hey, what are you poking that thing for? It smells awful. What is it though? Look at that. Clap, clap, clap. <laughs> Many believe that Oyashiro is still the guardian of Hinamizawa. And he curses anyone who ever tries to harm the village. <laughs> Gotta look for cute things and cute things and I love that zoom in. What is it? Take a look. So, what am I looking at? I don't know. Why are you doing this? Please stop <laughs> it. I can't take it. Me? Huh? Me. 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 Oh, wow! Nipa! Nipa! Rika's last name. I love how she literally sounds like an adult woman family. pretending <laughs> to be a child, but it works perfectly Nipa. because. 
I is what Rika is. In our nation's politics, then you should vote for a politician who expresses your same views. And if you can't find one, then jump into politics and try to change things that way. That's the bedrock okay, of democracy. So familiar. Go back to Tokyo. Centrist. Who are you? <laughs> <laughs> Seems they were having some stomach trouble, and it me too. Up. Take it down. Same. <laughs> Oh, same. I don't really understand what you're saying. Hold on. Satoshi, did you hear me? If you don't do this, you'll be playing right into their hands. <laughs> All right. We'd like to ask you two to come down to the station. <laughs> Dr. Irie. Detective Oishi? Well, you guys so <laughs> you. I thought the rule was clear. One dies and another disappears. But for some reason, this year, both Miss Takano and Mr. Tomitake were killed. How could you be so evil? Beats me. You're right. Oh, no. They're bad little kitties. Meow. <laughs> Two of them have since been captured and punished for it. Meow. <laughs> Something smells good. Is that a pot of stew I smell? I'm definitely gonna have to get me some of that before I head back. He is gonna come back. I know he will. And I'm gonna be here when he does. I'm gonna be here in a pot. I sure didn't see that coming. Of course not. You're not as good as I am. <laughs> if I were ever in any sort of danger, Kazai would be there to save me, wouldn't you? Not really. Thank you. It's good. Me. Oh, is she? What? <laughs> like, What's I up think with this piece of wood? I do think this is very <laughs> funny. There you I are. love the dub. It's just sloppy, and I think it fits so well. It kind of rips now. <laughs> so good. It's Thank you. Good. I love oh that. <laughs> It's wonderful, thank you. Uh, I spent way too too long on that. There were a couple ones in there that I was thinking about removing, but I was just like, ah, screw it, throw out everything in there. I, I don't really. <laughs> well, oh yeah. Also, yes, the piece of wood. I totally forgot about that until uh, I came across it, and I was like, oh, I need to make this an al a bit alert now. <laughs> just donate to have someone <laughs> pop up in the corner, like right here, and just like, what's with this piece of wood? <laughs> <laughs> I I think we've learned a lot about ourselves today. <laughs> I think we've learned a lot about Higarashi today. Nipa! Yeah. <laughs> Nipa. <laughs> also, uh, uh, Rachel was listening to me edit that the entire like day, and I was just guffawing at certain parts, like the the edit of um. Uh, just like uh, uh, Keiichi is so fucking stupid. <laughs> it's incredible. <laughs> that guy's a cop, <laughs> and then uh, the one with um, just <laughs> a, <laughs> a bad little kitty. Uh, yeah, goes meow, and then just she on pat pat pat. Oh god. Yeah, I might uh, I might post uh, some some bits of that. Maybe I'll post the whole thing on like Twitter or something. I don't know. You, you should. You should just put it Thank on you. YouTube. Or you could just post it on YouTube. Yeah, like yeah. I I would love to see that there. Yeah, sure. Higurashi bonus. Higurashi bonus. Hi everybody. Uh, after that um, horrible thing that I've cursed everyone with, uh, we're here. We're back. We're gonna talk for the last time about Higurashi. Um, I. I don't think it's the last time. With me today is, let's go reverse order. Jan. Nipa. 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 I like to use poison when I kill people. <laughs> Talzreel, how you doing? Pretty good. Pretty good? Cool. Numbers, how you doing? So listen, let me talk about the dog ending. Oh, I love the dog ending. I love a good dog ending. Ow, 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 ow. Olo, what's up? Hey, uh, I have my cicada earrings. I'm very excited. Oh, hell yeah. Hell yeah. Oh, I want to see those. Cat, what's up? Hey, what's this pizza wood? <laughs> Beats me. <laughs> Get it? Because it, it would be used to beat me. No, nothing. <laughs> I like how that joke. Oh, just... no, we have to kill him. The time's not funny. <laughs> yeah, the, the true Hinamiz Zawa syndrome. Kill anyone who isn't funny <laughs> or makes terrible dad jokes. Gail! No, Hello, I'm Hello. here to hate Han Yu for everyone. <laughs> Aw. But that's okay with me. <laughs> Thank you. We're here to talk about. Sakuroshi. But before we get to Sakuroshi, or the Arc 9, if you will, 
Um, we still have some more uh, things to talk about with Arc 8. So we're going to go ahead and uh, go back and uh, we're going to revisit the discussion from the last video at the beginning of this. And we're going to talk about that. And then we're going to go into Saikoroshi, the um, recap, and then discussion topics. And yeah, that's what we're going to do today. Um, so strap in. Uh, Kalathra, thank you very much for joining. Um, it would take me the same amount of time to read the manga, honestly. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, if you want to peace out, now's a good time because we're getting deep into the final, final chapters. Anyone who is afraid of spoilers and worried about that kind of stuff, um, Peace. Have a great time. Um, uh, Nipa. <laughs> but anyway, with that, let's go ahead and dive into it. All right. Uh, who wants to uh, bring up the first discussion topic? Um, uh, where Where is that? Ah, there we go. There we go. Okay, Arcade. Here we go. Um, did anyone have any particular topics to bring up? I know we talked about a bunch of this. Um, um, oh. I think it was mainly Gail who didn't get to share their thoughts. Yeah, okay. we lost Gail at the tail end of that. So. Okay. I'm sorry. I'm so no, sorry. no worries, no worries. Absolutely no worries. So yeah, pick, pick and, uh, yeah, pick, pick a topic and a uh, reminder, arc eight, spoiler heavy. So. Oh, geez. Okay. So I, I don't totally remember uh, the things that I had said versus the things that I didn't say. So me... uh, I, I did want to say, um, I think that the way that Ryukishi engages with religion is really interesting, not just in this arc, but every other arc. I kind of made a note of it because Olo had like mentioned uh, like sin, scapegoats, and sacrifice. And I, I kind of just wanted to like come back to the idea that Ryukishi is just kind of engaging with Christianity as this thing that was built by people. And I think that's a really interesting, I like that secular approach where it's like he understands and engages with why people may have faith or may even struggle with faith, like much in the case that Takano does, whereas Hifumi was very engaged with the idea of faith as something that would save him. And... I think this is going to, we're going to see this as sort of like a continuing topic of Ryukishi's, even though Christianity is like only 1% of Japanese people are Christians. But at the same time, it, it is this sort of struggle of American projection onto Japan, much like we see with the discussions of GHQ, General Headquarters, uh, MacArthur's involvement in the reconstruction of Japan and sort of like these other issues where Christianity kind of serves as a direct uh, reference to those ideas. Um, and it's just very interesting because it's just like Hanyu was also just, she's just a person who happened to decide that the way to solve these problems was through presenting herself as a scapegoat. And then Rika looks at that and she rejects that. She doesn't reject the idea of the uh, the, faith, uh, the faith and the culture of her town, but rather she rejects the idea of replicating how people used to engage with religion in the past. And I, I think that's a very progressive viewpoint to take. I think that's awesome. Yeah, definitely. I, I love does that it, read. Does anyone else have thoughts with regards to that? I'm just curious. I mean, I think especially with like what little we've learned about their background with, you know, Hanyu and Oka, I think it does make sense, especially because Oka even herself was like, I don't want to ever have to do this again. This sucks. No one should have to be a sacrifice. Yeah. Like mm -hmm. locking away that sword because she's just like, fuck this. I love my mom. Kind of resent her. And we're going to see that, I think, with Saikaroshi, but that's not the discussion yet. But yeah, it's like it really interesting the way that like the Furude family is like we can't forget the cruelty of our past but we can ensure that others understand why it was cruel I had a notation here about collectivism and individualism because it's always really interesting I've talked about this in the past I think specifically with episode 4 but since Matsuri Bayashi is kind of effectively the answer arc to um, the time killing arc, it serves to kind of return to the struggle of collectivism and individualism in this context. And I also think that discussing that in the context of America's 
ideas of collectivism and individualism also qualify here. Kind of going through uh, GHQ and how America sort of looked at the involvement, uh, their personal involvement in Japan, they were very invested in modernizing Japan effectively. And you can see that in the fact that they were also trying to Americanize. Like it is because of GHQ that women ended up with voting rights in Japan, for instance, or the constitution that they ended up building, which was actually a pretty solid constitution, was made in conjunction with GHQ. So it's like, it's complicated because there are a lot of messy issues there, but when they first went into it, they were focused on reconstruction. They were focused on very positive ideas, but as the concerns of the Cold War came in, they became very anti-collectivism in that way, and that gets heavily projected onto Japan as a whole. I find it really weird in that way though because in America we can see in America and Japan we can see how collectivism does become this tool of um right wing and the alt right where it's like you where it is of course like one group against another and I find that Japan has more individualism than a lot of sort of American viewers tend to consider. Uh, a very common thing that I've heard throughout my life is that, oh, Japan is a very collectivist country. Whereas, and they'll be like, oh, America is much more individualistic. And I, I do think, again, that that is based in post-World War II reconstruction of Japan, where a lot of those ideas, like I mentioned, were kind of like empowering individual citizens, kind of reaching out, um, breaking down monopolies, um, ensuring that uh, farmers in small towns, much like Hinamazawa, would uh, be able to actually own their own land, not have to pay as many subsidies to the rich, and other similar topics. And, uh, like, you know, you can see, um, I believe it's, <laughs> here I am forgetting Jap American presidents, FDR, right? Mm -hmm. You are yeah, forgiven yeah. For, forgiv for forgetting FDR. Yeah. It's, and it's like, <clears throat> There's plenty to criticize, of course, about FDR, but it's like that was a very positive influence post the Great Depression. And the Great Depression and combating against how harmful that was to America is the same connection to the depression and the destruction of war that happened in Japan after that. And of course, you know, once the Cold War started, you ended up with the Red Scare and that just ends up projected onto Japan, which again, like we see how that becomes a part of uh, pro-military, this attempt to remilitarize and, uh, and the way that collectivism ended up being turned into, in order to combat the idea of communism, they turned collectivism into an aggressive and cruel idea of bootstraps and blaming others for their individual problems. This is kind of rambling. I'm really sorry. No, no, no. It's actually really um, useful because uh, I was actually just thinking about that in the context of because um, I, I was in order to make that that shit post video, I was basically what basically re -go going through everything again. And yeah, no, it's actually uh, very interesting to approach that sort of idea with regard to like Hidemizao and the dam specifically. And how, you know, that, that is more of a, the, the, the collective argument, the collectivism argument is, um, oh, I'm getting into battle music. Here we go. Uh, the collective arg the collectivism argument for that, for the dam would be, you know, basically, Hey, you know, it's for the greater good, you know, it's, you know, by, you know, um, having this dam, it seemed, it seemed throughout the entire game that that was the argument that like, look, by building this dam and ruining all of your, you know, lives in this village and, you know, submerging the, the village underwater, you know, you would be helping Japan as a whole, you know, you would be helping everybody out, you know, and uh, so just do it, you know, and but the game is very has very clearly and Ryukishi has very clearly um, posited that as bad, like, there are, there are things there are multifaceted arguments all throughout Higurashi but that is like one of the one of the few things that's like black and white which in this and uh, the way that it's presented I would consider like the the dam itself being built to be I mean it's presented in Saikoroshi 
which we will get to, as a entirely bad thing. Like every yes. like everyone's lives are completely devastated by this. And um, you could also make that argument with uh, like the the argument for individualism as like um, posited by Higurashi and Ryukishi um, mm -hmm. in um, Satoko. Um, Satoko is basically you know. Um, like uh, getting, uh, you know, sort of approaching her own problem so that she can um, uh, basically uh, rely uh, or stop relying on um, uh, Satoshi. I mean, that's that's presented as like a solution, but not like a holistic solution in mm -hmm. my mind. Um, uh, like she, she, as a child, needs the support of a broader community, but it's also, like, her choice she wants to try to engage with herself as a person that can truly confront her own issues, even though that isn't all she needs. You need that mixture of both. Because right. if you become all, you either become an island or you become overwhelmed and lose your identity, much like what the LDP kind of wants to present, where it's just like, we don't have an ideology. We don't have anything. We're just concerned about the greater good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah, Ursula Cat, yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. Like individualism and collectivism are, are in my mind, present, presented as, uh, you know, tools, just like Ursula Cat was saying. Mm -hmm. um, that you know, neither one is like. Go ahead. How now. you define them as well? Mm. Did you want to expound on that? Um, I mean, just that like these these terms can oftentimes have like a lot of baggage and like loaded yeah. meanings to them. Mm. So mm -hmm. I think also it's like sometimes with these discussions, it's also a matter of what you perceive that term to even mean. Mm. So I think. You know, also, I think that, that that's also something to keep in mind with these, because like when when these come up in discussion, it's always like people discussing their idea of that. Mm -hmm. But then sometimes we don't even have like a necessarily <laughs> the same like connotative or denotative, you know, agreement on it of what that actually means. So I think, you know, not, not I don't think that any like you guys are using different definitions or anything, but I think that just in general with like these more like broader sweeping uh discussions of things like this sometimes that's also something to keep in mind i think oh of course <laughs> i found that um context can make things good or bad <laughs> indeed yeah I... astute observation yeah, like, and I, I wanted to bring this up just because I get really, really frustrated at how a lot of Americans will frame Japan as like this deeply collectivist country where people are, you know, they're all, I don't fucking even know, even though like in modern day Japan, you have like hikikomori or people who become shut-ins or people who just become like overwhelmed and emotionally uh, um, reclusive from society because they're pushed into such an aggressive like individualism where they feel guilty that they can't even handle their own problems um and, and that very negative quality of how individualism can work and even when you sort of like go further you look at the fact that there is a very major trend of like oh you need to not involve yourself in the problems of others you need to focus on your own problems if you see something happening around you you need to kind of like pull back and ensure that you're not intruding upon someone else's life even if they clearly are in need of help mm -hmm. and it's fascinating though and i truly think like higurashi's approach of this is very holistic as like bob was saying too and as Jan is saying, it's an incredibly complex topic that has a huge amount of context for all of our countries, which will have a very personal history with how those have shown themselves. Uh, numbers, I saw you, uh, you You mentioned something. Did you want to uh, talk uh, about this? Um, earlier, I had a bit of a thought start to form regarding like the concepts of collectivism versus individual individualism and then Ursula Cat kind of touched on it too just the right wing co-option of the term populism as something that deeply frustrates and antagonizes me 
Mm -hmm. Um, I I don't know. I don't know if I have, like, a really cogent opinion to make on the matter right now, like, anything, anything more nuanced to say besides then, that shit sucks. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, shit it's sucks, mm -hmm. and it's really frustrating. Yeah. Yeah, it's really frustrating to have millionaires funded by billionaires go on TV and call themselves populists because they're pitting one group against another for social means and culture war bullshit. It's very it's very frustrating and I sure do wish I was able to piece this together in a way that made it obvious that I woke up more than 20 minutes ago. <laughs> and yeah, like, I, I could definitely add on to that point in terms of like um, in Higurashi, like they even mentioned these Aibatsu, which were the monopolies of Japan uh, prior to and during World War II and those were broken up um, in part through aid of like America as it was, you know, responding in the same way it had to the Great Depression here, but because of you know red terror you get that huge sort of like negative response and these very rich people being able to prey on the fear of uh people and misinformation to make them believe that like the only way of socialism and communism is just like inherently destroying your rights and your identity and individualism even though ultimately they're just kind of pulling all of these people into an equally bad form of that where they say that like communism and socialism is inherently connected to fascism even though fascism is ultimately a very different thing from like these economic systems that <clears throat> we can try to apply or engage with in you know a variety of ways chat chat i love communism and vladimir Ilyich lenin is my dad <laughs> did you know that like uh USSR, first country to uh, legalize abortion, uh, that was Mr. Lenin, and and then Stalin came in, and he's like, oh, no, none of that. <laughs> There's no. a long, ruined everything. <laughs> There's a very long list of good things Lenin did that Stalin just immediately undid. Very long list of those. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Not a fan of the secret police, though. <laughs> no, no. There's a huge amount of issues there, but, like, those are connected to... Uh, like huge background of like existing uh, existing issues that they had to deal with from the monarchy. Yeah, that's its own can of worms of co-option of terms and authoritarian repression. It's it's yeah. so hard. Like there's no good way to even really go into that. But I did have this mention of uh, fascism and the idea of like compassion versus violence in the document. <gasps> Wow. So, Impressive transition. Um, we did it. Alice oh, we already did it? Some stuff. Oh, did we already talk about Yeah, you're right. Yeah, we don't need to go into that then. Oh, it was such a good transition. I, I, I'll, I'll just kind of mention, like, it, it reminds me of the impetus of, like, Springtime for Hitler and the producers, where they have both sort of, like, um, non-violent and violent ways of pushing back against, you know, the military and uh, Tokyo and all of their ideas, which I think is really interesting and meaningful. So I'm I'm not sure how meaningful that is because after all, Tokyo doesn't represent anything. <laughs> it's just a name. There's no politics <laughs> in Higurashi. Um, I'm just getting word that there's this liberal democratic party of Japan. I'm going to go look into this. Give me a second. They seem like good guys. They seem like they're I'm really concerned. Back. It seems like shit sucks. <laughs> no. Do they have an ideology, though? No, they don't. I, I will say, like, coming back to sort of, like, the idea of uh, the declining birth rate, like, you can really see the anti-immigration ideas there. Especially even though, like, Higurashi, again, like, wandering god. It's, it's blatant that Hanyu and her people are immigrants. <laughs> And they mm. were mistreated for it. Uh, we already mentioned justice versus revenge, but again, Ryukishi and restorative justice really, really like that. Really like his idea of engagement with like trying to treat the source rather than punish a person because punishment in that way is n <sighs> what's the word? It's uh, very typical that, of course, like someone will end up back in jail at, and uh, the uh, cycle. Yeah. Recidivism. Thank you. Yes. 
Yeah, and I do feel like he tries to examine his own, like, issues as well through EDA with, like, you know, treating people as though not, like, not criminals, but, like, you know, patients to be treated. But then also there are some inherent issues to that of, like, mm-hmm. how do you then handle certain issues in other ways? And possibly him being aware of that and wanting to, like, kind of admit to admit to some of the limits of that and how it's not a perfect approach either. That's what I kind of felt like. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It was such Agreed. a good presentation of that issue too because right out right out the gate it's like oh yeah hell yeah i'm totally down with what uh, what eerie is like going for yeah yeah no you know brain meat meat can go bad but then it it, the problem it's it's another great example of like the shades of gray that like you know the um that uh reikishi is so good at just like even a sort of sentiment that you would uh, on its face just kind of naturally agree with he like kind of you know widens the lens and suddenly, oh no, there's a whole bunch of other stuff to uh, include in the in this in this conversation. Like what constitute like what what does it mean to uh, solve that problem? Of, of you know of and technically, you are solving that problem with with fucking lobotomies. Like technically, and so it's like oh no, <laughs> like I'm wrong. I I agreed and now I oh no I things. It's almost like yeah. we got to think about stuff, y'all. It's <laughs> very good. He's like, he, he, I think that Ryukishi is also of like the mindset that like, obviously he wants to convince you of things, but he doesn't consider himself to be a perfect mm. um, or a like inherently, you know, ideologically pure figure. And mm. I, I think that's another uh, very interesting metatextual struggle that he himself is always dealing with as a writer. Was it? Um, one thing that I'm always coming back to when I'm thinking about Irie's whole thing is like, uh, what is it? Uh, I want to say in Sumi Horoboshi, uh, arc six, uh, there was a moment where like Keiichi is like sort of talking to himself and like, he's, um, he- he's basically like, uh, talking to himself about what's going on with Rena. And he's more, he says something along the lines of like, uh, Rena is still Rena, but she's caught like a, a, a cold of her her heart or her mind mm. and so it's like we just treat we we just treat this the stuff that she's going through it's like just treat it like a cold it's just something that she has to get some help for and then she'll be over it and done with and like i was struck by how like compassionate that kind of was when i first read it like um i'm i'm probably messing up the wording a little but the idea of like it's just a cold as opposed to like, this is something deeply wrong with this person, mm-hmm. which is, which is just so refreshing, especially when you're like, when you're a horror fan and there's so much to get into there, but like, um, but it's also like an interesting idea of like, yeah, you should treat this as like a, something that's not like inherent to their person, but it's also a matter of like, how do you treat something that is like, um, something that's like quote unquote scary like this without demonizing the the condition and by extension the person even if you don't try to which is interesting because um Takano's uh grandfather um I keep forgetting his, I know it's just Ifumi. Takano Ifumi. 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 uh I think that that was kind of the in for that conversation where you know it's all it's talking about you know um ideas as though they are, you know, um, themselves like, uh, uh, sort of infections. Um, I forget the exact wording that was used, but basically it it provided a way of like uh, talking about that stuff without actually demonizing the people who hold those ideas, which is an interesting tact to take. And then continuing that story with, um, you know, Takano is, (laughs) you know, we're at, we're in for some pitfalls, but at the same time, yeah, but yeah, no, no, totally. Uh, yeah, it's, it's very, it's very, yeah, there's a lot to consider here and yeah. Yeah. It's... Yeah. I feel like the fact that like his core belief, I think is that no one is inherently bad. I feel like that shows up in all of his writing showing very much how all of this is very contextual, how everyone has their own life, their own backstory, their own, you know, how they were raised the experiences they've had, how this all goes into it. And this also yeah. shows up in Psychodoshi as well, how experiences and how the things you've been through change you. 
and how like, yeah, inherently you might have this aspect of yourself, but then things affect that. And that's not necessarily your fault for being affected by your external environment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that there's uh, real quick, uh, I'm going to let other people speak. Um, but, uh, at the same time, like, you, you know, I get that. I, I get that very much from Ryukishi's writings specifically in Higurashi, but I also get, um, this very deep feeling of like, it doesn't even matter if that is technically true, that people are innately like good because you just have to have faith that they are mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because that, that is so much like I was going through arc. Um, uh, what was it? Seven again. And it's just like, it, that, it just smacks you in the face with just like, look, you know, you, you just have to believe these things because faith is so important in this conversation. Um, because if you don't like have faith, then, you know, it, it can lead you to make decisions that, you know, um, will basically damn people to be, you know, um, bad. And so you, you yeah, know, if you never believe things will never change. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So it's like, yeah, no, you're totally, totally accurate. Yeah. yeah. You just got to believe you, you have to. You just gotta believe. Just like Parappa oh. said. Just like mm -hmm. Parappa said. I thought Numbers was gonna break into a song, like a Disney song or something. I thought it was it gonna break the into the of cards. <laughs> um, don't do that. The cards don't trust you like you trust them. <laughs> I've been betrayed by plenty of cards. I've been betrayed by plenty of cards. <laughs> uh, Gail, did you have a? Uh, is there more uh, to talk about? I was going to add on to Olo's uh, kind of mentioning back in Sumihoro Belshi, um, and it's something I think is all important to all of Higurashi, um, the exploration of pathologization of mental illness, which I find to be a very major theme in Arc 1, as he, Ryukishi, I think, is most focusing on women as being turned into not just like villainous figures, but also sexualized figures through the conceit of uh, mental illness. Um, something I find fascinating is the rise of like the conceit of the yandere in anime as a trope. And Higurashi became actually very famous through its anime for that conceit. And, you know, characters like uh, Reina or uh, Shion in particular were seen as being kind of like very major figures of the yandere trope even though Ryukishi's own work is literally about deconstructing the idea of how the negative reactions and the idea of even just like having depression or struggling with aspects of psychoses these girls are turned into a greater evil than they actually are and Keiichi is constantly having to respond to and realize his own bias against the women in his life even though his own mental illness is not seen as something negative but rather something that deserves to be fixed and that continues within Sumihoro Boshi and <laughs> Matsuri Bayashi um, through the conceit and engagement of like Kifumi being suicidal, struggling with dementia, and him being a more sympathetic figure than Takano herself, technically, even though Takano's mental illness and trauma and PTSD is something that's been so broadly ignored. Her fixations, her interests are utilized to um, make people assume that she's uh, kind of like a freakish person and then only Tomitake is actually looking at her as a person until Rika within this arc is interested in actually trying to understand why would she do this? Why would she take this action? Even Irie having to take this action because he realizes I've been completely turning her into a two-dimensional person this entire time. Maybe I should actually talk to her. And when he talks to her, he realizes... Maybe I could have been able to do something about this sooner, <laughs> right? Yeah, I, I love that you mentioning this just got me to realize, is there a thing as senseless violence in Higurashi? Because I don't think there is. I think no. all of the, even the worst things that happen mm -hmm. in, this, in this game have motivations and thought behind them, even, it, even though it's distorted. And like, you yeah, know, even the attack with the foreman, I think has some level of, you know, thought and it's consideration. Very much like yeah. Uh, toxic masculinity also there, mm -hmm. much like Keiichi's violence against like young girls specifically. I um, 
I was about to say, like, I think the only thing I could call maybe senseless violence is probably not real. Mm. Um, I mean, like, when Kiichi believes, like, a group of random unknown villagers are beating the shit out of him <laughs> in Arc 1. Like, I, I guess that is... That is technically senseless violence, but it also probably isn't real. Did it? Yeah. Uh, did I it happen? I thought it was real. I thought it was the mountain dogs. Yeah, I thought it was yeah, the mountain was dogs too. Oh, it might have been the mountain dogs. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It, in which case, it, there is still a reason behind it. It's yeah. They're, they're like, oh, this kid, <laughs> this kid's going terminal. We got to stop him. Yeah. He's got to lobotomize vibing. his child. <laughs> mm -hmm. This kid's wigging out. Yeah. The only way that that uh, at, the, at the same time. Actually, numbers, are you right? Because why would the mountain dogs run away from, like, uh, Rena? Like, what what do they have to be afraid of with Rena? Because I, I would argue that they weren't afraid. It's more along the lines of, like, they can't blow their cover. And it's mm. they, they pretty much handle everything with the utmost secrecy. And if two kids in the village disappeared at once, then that would be genuinely suspicious, especially since they're related to Rika. Mm -hmm. mm, yeah i guess that makes sense i, I just uh, we've seen them so many times like you know uh uh, uh, uh what, what's his name hitman uh, like hitman uh assassinate a bunch of people um <laughs> so it's just like in my mind it's just like why not pew, pew you know rena and then just and then oh no she fell on a bullet ah anyway <laughs> okanogi keyed my car the other day oh that <laughs> bastard I don't know why he did it. I don't know him. <laughs> I keyed uh, Oishi's car, so uh, kind did you of deserve even? it. Well, he's a a he deserves it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I guess I think the most senseless violence I can come up with was would be Tepe's own abuse, uh, since he since he's one of the most uh, two dimensional, I guess, of the characters. That's true, mm -hmm. but at the same time. If you're talking about the anime, absolutely true, one thousand percent. You are you hit the nail on the head. If we're talking about the VN, um, there is actually like in a lot of the the um, notes, um, there is actually thought behind um, what even Tepe is doing, and Tepe is doing it largely because uh, it, it's it, Ryukishi explains it as though that is the world he knows, that is mm -hmm. all he knows. He, I he doesn't he's too stupid to like communicate with people he only can communicate through violence and it frustrates him that he's not able to communicate his needs and and wants with um sotoko as uh, in the same way that he can do it with um oh Re rena rena yeah. yeah yeah and i feel like it's not saying that to excuse him but more to explain no. it and exactly. like <laughs> also kind of saying how like the dam conflict also involved him even though he had nothing to do with it he just happened to be related to the guy who mm -hmm. did the thing and like that frustrated him and stressed him out more and again that doesn't justify anything he did but it shows how when he's under more pressure and things are going worse for him that makes him more likely to lash out yeah think about the things that he does so to the factor that was involved yep yeah was it um one thing that I've pulled from, um, I think I've brought up this video before, but like the, the Nick Spears slash Maylitz videos on like the not safe for life iceberg is, is that like, there is a reason behind basically every sort of like horrible, violent thing that happens. The difference is the reason isn't always like, um, it, it doesn't always satisfy you. It can be. It can be something as like shallow as, oh, for whatever reason, this person just wanted to hurt someone that day or just like a natural disaster happened. And like um, with Tepe, it's like, yeah, he does have a reason for this. It's because he he knows how to communicate through violence. And that's he's just communicating like not as a this again, not to excuse it, but it's like this is why this is happening. There is like reason behind yeah. a lot of these things that happen. Not always good reasons, but there are reasons. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I feel like he, he really does a approach his world building with that in mind. Very much so because like there there was that one staff uh, meeting or after party thing where they mentioned that, like basically the characters are the same in every instance. Mm -hmm. but, like obviously other factors change, the story around them changes. So it's like it's showing how all of them have their internal consistency 
And he's thought about that, which is very important for maintaining that characterization and reaction to the plot. But like, like understanding, you know, good reasons or bad reasons, or like there's still reasons for characters doing things. Like nobody does anything for no reason, even if there's like some small arbitrary reason there is a reason and i feel like that's mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. that very much cause and effect or at least like a variable affecting it sort of approach to this thing it gives it much more internal consistency which gives it a stronger story overall i think yeah i think horror in general has a tendency to label people as crazy and then just not investigate like decisions and thoughts behind what's going on and why crazy people are doing crazy things and even be, uh, to the point where it even inspires mm, apathy you know uh, in those but the way that Ryukishi does all uh, like uh, has all of the the story set up every every nook and cranny of the story is just like there is reason here there is thought here there's a reason why people are doing what they're doing to call them crazy would be to dismiss all of that and you know, that kind of sucks. Um, so anyway. Yeah. And I feel like that's why even with it being like technically kind of unfair, the syndrome being like the, a, like a major key in why people act the way they do. Like, I feel like that, even though that's technically like not a great thing to do in mystery fiction in general, I feel like because there is that internal consistency and like, it's actually like explored in detail you know later on but like there is a thought behind it beyond just oh and then this this is just there for no reason and that like that's just why it's like no i think i think because of the specific way he handles this sort of thing it makes it you know not unfair it makes it like mm -hmm. no that actually makes sense to me mm -hmm. uh, even oh, like oh. go ahead numbers okay i was about i was just going at it also has very clear rules I think. Yeah, that's um, really important. <laughs> yeah, which I do think it's possible to read the syndrome in the way as like a plot device necessary for characters to act out of character or whatever, which it, in the sense that I have seen people read it that way, even if I don't agree with that. They they all act within their character. I would say mm -hmm. it's just that they're yeah. put into a scenario I, where they're like locking themselves off from the like, way I yeah being pushed to their extremes. Yeah, mm -hmm. the way I personally characterize it is that it's more like a kind of switch being flipped between two perceptions of a character, as in the ways that they perceive things around them and how they would react and so mm -hmm. on. I I am once again struggling to phrase things in a way that I think is smart and good. <laughs> well, you are smart and good, so no need to I'm just, worry about that. I'm just, you know, waking up, so I'm <laughs> Well, what's crazy. my excuse then? <laughs> like, I don't, yeah, I, I've been awake I'm all day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, syndrome being a spotlight on the negative aspects of their character. I like that. I like that word, Ursula Cat. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, pushing people to their yeah extremes. Like It doesn't time. It doesn't invent characteristics of their personality or behavior or whatever. It just amplifies and makes people a worse version of themselves through paranoia, in a sense, apathy and losing, losing caring about other people. And this whole series is Ryukishi kind of putting his hands on your shoulders and going, I'm going to make you care about other people. <laughs> Please, for, for the love of everything. And yeah, I think it's kind of him showing how like we all have our own conditions for making us act a certain way. Yeah, yeah. And the syndrome mm. is a plot device in some sense that exists to flick off that switch of empathy and caring about other people for a given character. Mm. Yeah, uh, I will come to the defense of anyone who says the... Uh... The syndrome is not a great like mystery device, mostly because like uh, in a mystery, like you know, when a murder is committed, there is like even a, p a purer intent there than just say like, oh, they, you know, he, uh, the syndrome made them do it. So I do think From... it could have been done better. 
from a well, yeah, but it's not just the syndrome. It's like that amplifies their paranoia, and it, that gives yeah. them like reason to suspect others. Right, but you don't yeah. necessarily yeah. It's need not mindless. The, yeah, it's not mindless, but you necessarily don't need the parent like the syndrome to cause that paranoia. Like, mm. from a pure golden age mystery mm. perspective, it's a little rough. I'll give it that much, but it serves a different purpose that is outside the confines and conventions of that precise genre it works well just in a slightly different context and a yeah we're trying to talk about other things yeah no when people argue about um like higurashi as a mystery like i i do think fun uh, at the end of it it there are criticisms to be had about the mystery but its end goal of that is its themes is much more important yeah i would agree with this and I, I would kind of add on to that as like, I, I think at many points, Ryukishi is very invested in kind of breaking down what's typical within mysteries and uh, being willing to kind of go back and utilize ideas that might not be um, sort of like sound at the level of a mystery. And th- the point kind of being more along the lines of challenging you through okay so these people are doing horrible things what do you think of them and then later on saying okay imagine that what they're doing and why they're doing it is because of an illness that is like physically affecting them like how now how do you feel like do you feel like they're more justified and i think that's a major question that comes up in um Mayakashi with Shion, where he's like, okay, did I make you feel bad for her? Did I make you feel sympathy for her? Um, it, and, and like, you know, as, as you can say, like, that's dealing with themes. Um, but again, like, I, I think that was very much an active choice on his part uh, in terms of being willing to buck the trend and being willing to use sort of like stereotypes to lean into how people are already stereotyping the mentally ill. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I like that. I, I like that. I like that thought. <laughs> and I like the way you say the thoughts that you have in your head, Gail. I think you're very smart, and I like listening to you. You're I the have, best. Sam. I have a few thoughts. <laughs> um, Thinking about things. Stuff and things? <laughs> on occasion. No. Oh, um, dangerous. The last... Dangerous. <laughs> The last thing I kind of wanted to mention were a few more sort of like interview tidbits that I really liked uh, oh, from these discussions. Let's do it. Um, so uh, I think it's really interesting. He mentions the Village of Eight Graves as a really meaningful influence on him. Uh, what that's is by that? Seishi Yo- uh, that's by Seishi Yako Mizo, who is a Japanese mystery writer. And it very recently, in I think the 2010s, got an English translation, so you can buy and read that. Uh, He said it was a huge influence on the setting and how he wrote the setting. Um, Of course, he also says the Blair Witch Project was a huge influence on him and the entire reason that he included tips, because the ARG element of the Blair Witch Project was hugely important for him in his perspective of building up that external horror and making it feel very real and grounded. I knew I remember, I recognized that from somewhere. I knew that that storytelling element. Can I whine about something Gail reminded me of? Uh Uh-oh. This is tangential, but it sure is frustrating that a lot of very influential Japanese mystery novels do not have English translations at all, despite their importance to the genre in Japan and Mm -hmm. influence being felt on um, works that they inspired. Like, there... One that the one that bothers me tremendously is one that's mentioned in passing in Umineko. That is Dogura Magara is like very influential as like this weird metafictional kind of complex horror mystery thing, and it's very clearly an influence in a lot of ways, and is specifically named in Umineko at one point. And also, it uh, doesn't have any English translation. And its only translation that exists is in French. From, like, 
30, 40 years ago, and it's like a million dollars. Yay. <sighs> it yeah, just... It's a concern, but... Untranslated material is frustrating, especially when it's an important influence that would give you more of a sense of the foundations of the thing that you like. Mm -hmm. I think you can see, though, that like there's a contempt, I think, for mystery novels in uh, modern Western um, kind of like considerations. So, like, they're seen as like more passe. They're seen as more tropey and other aspects. And like, there are issues, of course, with um, mystery novels kind of becoming seen as like you know dime store serials and um, not the kind that you eat. <laughs> Uh, serializations and that that's kind of just been around for a long time even though you know there's tons of very meaningful stuff there it's tragic mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the village of eight craves i got yes. a, a oh there's an audiobook mm -hmm. yeah i i do recommend that cool um let me see here uh ryukishi planned for higurashi to be one game uh he's very foolish <laughs> uh, he was very nervous about quitting his job because there was a recession and he had a very stable job, but he did not want to continue that job. He's much happier now. Um, he says that the style in terms of a sound novel was influenced by uh, early 90s sound novels, Otori Goso and Kamaichi no Yoru, which do both have English releases, I believe, at this point. They were released, like, in the 2000s. And those are very early sound novels. Like, when Ryukishi says, talks about these influence of visual, of uh, sound novels specifically, even though, like, Tsukihime is the reason, for instance, his brother learned coding in Enscriptor, which is the system that Higurashi originally used, Ryukishi was influenced by, like, completely different style. Like, the reason he wrote a mystery novel was because of those. And I, I do have them uh, mentioned and linked in the Matsuri Bayashi uh, discussion document under the interviews. So that if you're interested in looking into those further. Uh, Yata Zakura, his brother, says that he created the fragment system in three days. Oh. So good for him somehow. Don't know how. Oh. It took... I would imagine that there was a whole extra day dedicated to just making sure that the extra fragment worked correctly. Uh, a little bit, yeah. Because that sounds yeah, that, that, painful. That shit ain't easy. You always bug test. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. Uh, this game would fail a bug test in an instant. There's so many cicadas. <laughs> Boo! Yeah, th there were oh, mentions dang. of like... Th there were mentions of several like actual bugs during like early release like i think they mentioned when they mastered watanagashi like the day of comic they were like oh there's a fucking uh broken thing where like the sound just doesn't work <laughs> like what why is this happening <laughs> Whoa. Mm -hmm. oops uh, oh man oopsies I, but yeah they they were in hell um bt mentions that uh when he was still working while writing um he literally like passed out on the stairs he was doing very poorly um was that originally uh maybe flowed into the story for a certain character mm, i wonder <laughs> <laughs> um let me see here uh, he originally planned for there to only be six episodes, but because he included Himatsubushi Hen, he ended up doing uh, Matsuri Bayashi, he stated. Um, he wanted, he, in, he started Kai with Shion's escape, so he wanted to end the story with Takano uh, and her failure to escape from the orphanage, basically. Um, he uh, talks about, like, of course, the good thing about Hinamazawa syndrome is that you can get away with calling it a viral disease. Uh, don't you think that mental illness is an excuse is unacceptable when a murderer is caught and told that he is going to the hospital because he is mentally ill? It's hard to accept, but when a train crashes and the driver is told he had apnea syndrome, I feel sorry for him. That's why I think the world can understand organic diseases, but they do not understand mental diseases. Keiichi killing Reina and Mion uh, is taken by itself and reported publicly as a story about a mentally ill boy who beat two of his classmates to death. However, readers have the premise that he had Hiramazawa syndrome, so they will have more sympathy for him as a victim. Keiichi's sins are forgiven because of the Hiramazawa syndrome, 
um, because it is a viral or a parasitic system. And that is what Han Yu means when she talks about taking on the sins of others. She has created this idea of a physical illness that affects people that can be treated when they think that mental illness cannot be treated. And like, because we were discussing that earlier, I believe I mentioned that last week too, but I really find that to be an important notation that he makes as well. Um, he says that Takano was originally meant to be a character like Nomura, but after changing out Irie from being the mastermind, uh, she became a very different character. Um, Nomura is someone who doesn't care. She has no ideology and is not interested in who her clients are, um, much like the LDP. Um, in the world of Higurashi, he talks about the idea of good and evil, and there's no such thing as absolute evil. But then he goes on to say, people who reject whatever people say or whatever p opinions they express, I do find to be pure evil. In the case that someone isn't really evil, if they have an opinion that agrees with yours, you're, you affirm it. And if you have a different opinion, you reject that. That's normal. However, people who express their identity by denying other people's words and feelings... I find to be a genuinely evil thing. And I think that's interesting that he frames it that way, where it's like, it's okay to disagree with someone, but when you exist to deny an entirety of a person, that is a truly cruel thing. It's neat. Um, I did mention, uh, I think last week, that Mina Girl, she he sees as the true end, whereas Matsuri Bayashi is sort of like the fantasy epilogue. Um, but then, of course, he went on to Psycho Roshi. Um, the fact that Rika cannot be saved without the presence of a metagod called the player is similar to the phrase, like, did you believe as the reader? Hanyu exists as a proxy for users who can see but not speak. The reason she's so active is because she's doing everything the player wanted to do. Um, he says that Akasaka really doesn't have a character. <laughs> um, sure he does. He he sure felt kind of bad about that. Fists. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's my, um, my character is fist. Yes. And uh, wife. Yeah, dead. please go ahead. That's a character trait. <laughs> I think. A feeling when girl die. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I apparently the whole the, the whole bit where like uh, Rika gets a phone line was originally he got drunk in a phone booth and Rika shows up and tells him he's pathetic and then he changed <laughs> it to like the phone line being cut and uh, he thought that was more fun. <laughs> it characterizes Rika a lot though for that but her calling him pathetic is also pretty great but she already does that a lot in that act, act so act. good for her. <laughs> act, act, you're a fucking loser. <laughs> she already called you. I love her. We could just I all... love her totally um, ner um, nagging him the whole time. <laughs> God. <laughs> I mean, you know, uh, quote Rika, men are weak. So we could just infer on that <laughs> in the yeah, anime. Yeah, she's a misandrist. <laughs> I <laughs> respect her. <laughs> oh, my God. Um, and Ryukishi says, uh, choices can only be made when you know the outcome of both, so you have room to choose. If we don't know the results of both, there would be no room to choose one or the other, and we would have to choose according to a certain predetermined law. Um, if you have to choose between a small basket and a big basket, you can remember the fairy tale, the sparrow with the slit tongue, and decide what, that the small one is better, so under the conditions where you don't know what's inside, you always take the small casket. For those who don't know the outcome, the choice to advise between whether or not to advise Keiichi um, about who she should give the doll is certain. But only Rika, who can assume both cases and knows she knows the outcome, can give you the choice called fate. This is Rika's world. She has a choice in everything every day. She is enduring a world full of choices. If I do this, I'll be in this arc or this arc or this arc. Every day for her is like a game book. Yeah, if she yeah. decides to pedal too fast one day, uh, you know. <laughs> yeah. end up in another hell world. Yeah. Um, the sparrow with the slit tongue, by the way, is a uh, Japanese um, fairy tale where this guy takes in a sparrow that's tongue has been cut out and he helps it back to health. And his wife is really cruel and wants him to get rid of the sparrow. And one day she kind of like gets the sparrow out of the house, but and uh, he's trying to find it again. But the sparrow has been able to go back to sort of like its sparrow village and they offer him the choice between a small, a small basket and a large basket. 
uh, he takes a small one because he doesn't want to impose upon them. And he goes back home and it's full of like wonderful treasure. His wife, who is very, um, very greedy and selfish, goes back and she asks for a basket and she picks the big one and she immediately opens it up and uh, it basically eats her. So that's kind of like... Hey, that same thing was used in an uh, Dr. Slump Arale OVA that I saw. Neat. Neat. Yeah, it's a popular one. It's an Okami too. Did, did um, Arale win? Yeah. Um, uh, Rikishi says, uh, we are literally saving and loading over and over again, so we don't make the mistakes we made last time. Some people refer to Rika as being a looper, but I personally call it saving and loading. That's how she's been living for over 100 years. And of course, there are choices that are just determined by Rika's will and coincidences that are determined by the will of the gods. Either choice is okay with like the Keiichi thing, at first, I had thought maybe I'll have it progress to Watanagashi, but that wouldn't show, like, the nature of Keiichi defying fate. So I decided to make it the same outcome regardless. Rika confirmed save scummer. She <laughs> is. Just when I'm imagining Rika in one of those really tacky gamer shirts. <laughs> God. You know, you look like en um, enough XP. All that dress. Gamers oh, yeah. don't die. <laughs> They reload. <laughs> Thank you. Oh my god. We're gonna have to commission some art. <laughs> oh god. Delete Fortnite repeat. <laughs> I hate it, thanks. Uh, don't talk uh, to me. I haven't gamed yet. Or what? I just and... made that one up. Fuck it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, I'm not, I'm a gamer not because I have a life but because I have many. <laughs> <laughs> that's the per that's the one. That's the one. <laughs> Um, another really interesting note that he made is he's talking about the Onikakushi uh, all cast review session where they're talking about is it a human or a curse or a coincidence and he says the answer is everything it's a the culprit is a human the curse exists and there's tons of coincidences and it's not that all one of them happened it's that all of them happened at the same time the only problem is that humans don't understand curses and the one who put on the curse isn't interested in humans and the coincidences are just human error. Um, is it a human, a curse, or a coincidence can also be a symbol of the rule X, Y, Z. So that's, I think that's neat. I just think it's neat. Yeah. I um, think Hikarashi's neat. <laughs> uh, he says, when we asked fans to send their thoughts on how to save Satoko, uh, there were none. <laughs> there were no thoughts on how to save her. Really? Uh, we got a lot of people who said, um, they would do what Keiichi did, but they're like, he should have hidden the body better, or I'd do it the same way. But the fundamental problem was that Satoko was unhappy because her uncle took back, came back. I received zero suggestions on how to solve it meaningfully. That's why the first half of Minogoroshi is the true solution to Tatari Goroshi <laughs> I was trying to give the answer, if you, like, actually engaged with each other and talked about it, you could have saved Satoko. <laughs> <laughs> um... Rika is uh, struggling. Um, do, 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 do. Hanyu is upset because they can't go back without Rika's um, approval. Uh, it's unbearable for Hanyu without Rika. And that's the difference between them. Like, a free being like Hanyu could have walked around at will and searched for a culprit. But then why does she not know anything and keep telling Rika to give up and that there'll be another time? And he gives a bitter laugh. <laughs> <laughs> Which is neat. I like that he's very... Um, Maybe kind of negative about Hanyu at times. <laughs> I think she's earned it. Yeah. Um, he says he doesn't want to share everything about the story. He wants people to have fun saying, this is what I think, even though this is what the original says. But after all, when the original says that's how it is, it kills all of the different possibilities that creators were making. I almost didn't want to release Matsuri Bayashi, but I had no other choice if I wanted to finish the story. So it was like a painful confession on my part. Sorry, there's a lot of things in the interviews that I thought, this is like from a ton of different interviews and his development blog. Um, he says Tokyo is not an evil secret organization like people imagined. I was just showing it like a factional society. Um, there's tons of different things like universities have academic cliques. There's people who just, uh, seek out each other. There is a uh, gerontocracy, which is a um, 
basically a political system that's controlled by the elderly and the uh, the older sort of influential people. And like the original image of Tokyo is essentially a collection of those kinds of organizations. Uh, let's see. Ryukishi says he stopped drawing manga because he could not depict the four-dimensional world in his mind with his drawing skills. Um, he couldn't draw what he wanted to draw. It was very painful. In order to express myself, I had to adjust my ideas to a level that I could express. With writing, I can actually express myself. Though with diligent, it's not easy. In indulgent activities, unlike manga or games, it's hard to get people to pay attention to your writing. In Comicat, the area where the writing-related circles are located is just called the highway. I'm sure that's relatable to a lot of us. <laughs> um, he talks about how um, rules of places are not universal, but they're local. But if you do break them, there's going to be retaliation. Uh, Higurashi depicts the horror of uh, Hinamazawa as a village society, but the horror is a problem stemming from its local rules and people. Uh, he says, I often hear from people who have played that being chased by a girl with an axe is really scary, but I do not think that's what the real horror is. The mm. horror that occurs in the village is not something that only exists in games. It's around us. Japan itself is closed. It's terrifying. People live by mutual intimidation. People live by nature, holding a knife to each other and never approaching each other. And it's somehow as though the Japanese have forgotten they're holding knives. They think the world is not scary. He has some very interesting thoughts about that. Uh, he says that like the first time he was ever scared was when he started being bullied for not having the money for video games and his friends just started rejecting him. Um, uh, an interviewer he was talking to says like most gal games are about like lukewarm times. It's about enjoying slow and lazy days where nothing happens. Higurashi uses the gal game format in a meta way. Um, nothing is eternal, Ryuki, she says. That's why there's a part of us that is longing for it. Unless you are aware of the finite tr nature of life, you cannot understand the horror of society. The reason everyone follows the rules is because if you break them, you will suffer terrible consequences. In the real world, you never know what will happen if you take off your mask. The story of Igarashi was not created from beginning to end. I created the setting, then the characters, and then I gave each character a purpose. Each character would move a lot around the setting according to their goals. It's like a tactical RPG in terms of its construction. All of the characters are NPCs and move according to their own victory conditions. They move autonomously in that way, so if we follow the viewpoint of one character, it becomes one arc. And then characters are moving otherwise freely in places that Keiji cannot see. And I think that's a really interesting way that he describes his creative process. Um, Rikishi says, I don't care if you guess who the, uh, who the culprit is. I want you to understand the structure of the story. I want you to understand the rules. I want you to find out the common denominator and what forms that basis. If you can figure that out, you can create a new scenario for Higarashi by yourself. Da, 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 da. I think, uh... Ryukishi says, um, he didn't include choices eventually. He wanted everyone to work with their heads, so he included the review sessions, uh, to encourage reasoning. If you play a game and finish it normally, I don't think you can, con I can fully convey the four-dimensional world I have in my mind. You enjoy it for the first time, for real, only after you think about it with other people. Um, Higurashi is the first game to really respond to the new situation of the expansion of computer networks and the internet, and that Higurashi decided to deny the conventional computer games by eliminating choices, it acquires an infinite gameplay that unfolds between humans. And that's all the interview bits I pulled out. <laughs> Sorry <laughs> for that being so long, I think it's really interesting. Um, I yeah. think that was really previous. worthwhile, though. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, mm -hmm. I love it. That's good stuff. That's good stuff. Yeah. Um, that, that's, I think, everything that I didn't get the chance to mention. Sorry for taking so long. I really enjoyed yeah. what everyone had to say about the different topics, though. Always love it. Yeah, absolutely. Were there any other uh, topics that we wanted to uh, visit on this stock? Before this arc, uh, I said on mine. I think we got to basically all of them. Okay. Yep, I think we did. All right. And with that, let's go ahead and move on to arc nine, Sakuroshi. All right, y'all. Uh, 
yeah, let's go ahead and let Jan uh, take over. And uh, yeah, let's uh, let's recap this and then uh, get into some discussion stuff. All right. Um, <clears throat> let me just put aside what I was working on there and pull this up. Sure. Okay. Let's see here. Get my notes going. Okay. Uh, content warnings for this one. Not really that much. There's not really all that much intensity other than, I guess, there's the violence um, mm -hmm. between Rika and Satoko. And there is off-screen murder. So compared to Matsuri Bayashi, much lighter in terms of what you watch out for. I guess there also is her head getting squashed by the car. <coughs> <laughs> That's not shown. That's normal. <laughs> okay. Um, <clears throat> so, first off, all of the kids are riding their bike back to uh, Hinamizawa after spending the day at the pool as per Rika's request. She gets knocked off her bike and gets knocked into another world. She wakes up at, in the nurse's office at school and she wonders if she's gone back in time since Satoshi is there. Satoko is made to apologize for hitting her with the ball, but she doesn't seem very sincere, and Rika feels like she's acting off compared to how she remembers Satoko usually acting. Instead of Irie, the doctor who comes to check on her is a man named Yamamoto. She's taken to the clinic, where she doesn't recognize anyone there, and she realizes it's called the Takano Clinic, not Irie Clinic. Turns out in this world it was founded by Hifumi Takano. It isn't clear whether Tokyo is involved or not in this world, and Dr. Yamamoto doesn't seem to know about Queen Carrier Theory. The calendar in the clinic shows that she's in June 1983, and even, even though Satoshi is still around. She then walks back to school. Rika notices that things seem quieter in town, and there are half as many students at school as she remembers. All of her friends seem to be having happy, normal lives, especially Satoko, Satoko and Satoshi. No one stays for the after-school games club, Mion refers to Rika as Rika Chama and Reina as Reina with an I. <clears throat> she learns then from Reina that the dam conflict never took place, so the town will be underwater in a year. Also, no one in the class is especially good friends with Rika. In fact, the Hojos and Ryugus never had their usual tragedies, so they're living life normally. There was no death and no divorce. Rika goes back home and realizes that her parents are also still alive. So she has to sneak into the storehouse through an alternate route instead of using the key. She tries to get in touch with Hanyu and eventually finds a crystal that allows her to faintly hear her. Hanyu says <laughs> that Rika died from the car accident, so she had to rewind time again. But there's a force in the village which is preventing her from entering and being there with her. She can't bring Rika back to the original world until they find a fragment and return it to the realm of the gods so Hanyu's power can take effect. Hanyu can't tell her exactly what she's looking for, just that it's connected to Oyashiro-sama. Rika can only use the crystal communi to communicate with Hanyu in limited quantities since it's essentially running low on magic batteries. Rika's dad catches her and beats her for entering the storehouse. Then, at school... Rika realizes that her seat is in the corner of the room, cut off from everyone else. No one seems interested in spending time with her at lunch other than Reina. When she looks longingly at Satoko, Satoko interprets it as something creepy and tells her to cut it out. Rika cries in the bathroom and takes care not to let anyone know how much she's hurting. She ignores Satoshi on the way out of school and runs straight home. She then spends her time searching the storeroom methodically for a whole week and comes up with nothing. She texts in with Hanyu again, who says that the way to return the fragment to the realm of the gods is to destroy its form completely and remove it from this world. If it's inside a person, that means that she has to kill them. She tries to tell herself it's okay if she has to kill them, because this world isn't real anyway, more like a daydream that she wants to snap out of. She takes some old documents with her to read later, in case they might point her towards the answer. She then notices an unattended alcohol delivery at her front door and swipes a bottle of wine indulging in a desperate attempt to cope with her unra unraveling sense of self. She starts to question her entire identity, whether she has any right to exist inside her alternate self's body, whether she's stealing her life from her, whether she even can call herself by that name or experience things in her stead. Taking a name from the wine, she decides to go by Frederica Berncastel to, differenti to differentiate herself from the Rika of this fragment. Berncastel, as I will be referring to her from now on, 
tries to check other people for fragments, starting with Rika's mom, acting friendly towards her for once. She doesn't feel anything from her and moves on. On the way to school, she notices she re thinks that she thinks about how Watanagashi is coming up as the town's final festival, but she doesn't care about it all that much. She's gotten used to walking alone and being ignored. At school, Satoko bullies Baron by taking the document she disguised as a book and tossing it around the room to the other students. She realizes that this version of Satoko is so different from the one she knows that she shouldn't even consider them the same person. She retaliates by punching her in the face and then beating her with a chair. Reina gives her the, the book back, but Ben isn't inter interested in trying to be friends with her. Ben gets taken to the principal's office and brushes him off when he tells her to try to get along with him. She's sent to the nurse when he realizes her hand is bleeding from the fight, where Satoko is being checked out for her injuries. She tells them to apologize to one another, which Baron only does to avoid getting detention, which would cut into her investigation time. Dr. Yamamoto checks on her, and they talk about her situation. He thinks that Rika must be sad about her friends all moving all way at once. Baron decides to tell him the truth when he notes her, her personality has changed since the ball hit her. He listens to her story about being from an alternate world, which she can tell is probably just him humoring her as part of his job, but she tells him anyway. She tries to explain how important it is for her to return to her own world as soon as possible and how she's been in contact with Hanyu. Dr. Yamamoto tries the crystal to see if he can hear Hanyu for himself, but since it's low on power, it doesn't work. He offers to try to help her study the old documents and find a way for her to return to her world if she's able to recharge the crystal's power and prove to him that Hanyu is real. She knows that if she can't convince him, he'll probably have her institutionalized and sedated for the rest of her life, which is the same as death in this context. After school, Satoshi, Mion, and Reina stop Baron to try to talk to her. Mion partially blames Baron for her situation, but also tries to offer a way for them to try to get along. Satoshi, Satoshi suggests that they could start the games club and try to get along together that way. Mion talks more in depth about Rika's past and how she was spoiled. In this world, Rika used to have friends who spoiled her, a group of boys, and she liked to use them to get her way. Then they all suddenly moved away, leaving her at the mercy of the other students who didn't like how things were before. Reina tells her that she needs to take responsibility for her situation and try to get along with everyone instead of pushing them away. Ban feels guilty about doing this instead of trying to give this world's Rika to have... Uh, try, trying to give her a chance to have a happy life with everyone else. Reina confesses that they overheard some of her conversation with the doctor and that she can't get back what she had before, but they can try to make something new, which is nice as well. Ban considers her options, which involves killing Rika for good to escape to her own world or to kill herself to allow, to allow Rika to have a life again. That is, figuratively killing herself by just destroying her own ego and memories. She goes home by herself to try to figure out what to do next. At the Furude estate, Rika's mother tries to ask her to help her make curry for her dad, and Baron decides to bury herself within the Rika role to allow Rika to feel the connection with her mother that she never had with her own. She feels that she may have cut that bond off so she wouldn't feel sad each time she died, taking on more guilt and blame towards herself in this line of thinking. The more she plays the role, the more she has a hard time feeling this world is real, still struggling with her identity. After dinner, she catches Rika's parents talking about Dr. Yamamoto, confirming that he really was just humoring her, and plans to send her to a hospital tomorrow. Rika's mother notices Ben Castell listening and explains the situation to her, causing her to disconnect even more from herself and the situation she's in to allow Rika to experience kindness from her mother that she never felt. Rika's mother talks about her own experiences in the village, sharing stories and secrets, including the fact that she is considered Oya Shiro-sama's reincarnation in this world, not Rika. Ben Castell realizes that the warmth and power she feels from Rika's mother may be the fragment, and the fact that she is the reincarnation in this world may be what is preventing Hanyu's power from accessing the village. In the storehouse, she confers with Hanyu. Hanyu tells Baron about her life and how she lost hope in the human world, which is why she made herself the scapegoat and made her daughter, Oka, the one to kill her, and cleanse the village of its sins. Oka then structured the village as it is today in an attempt to facilitate a society where scapegoats weren't necessary and people could trust one another by fearing the curse of the demon god that she slew. 
Hanyu grew to miss the human world in her thousand years of isolation and thinks that she might have made a mistake by undoing Rika's death the first time she was killed. That not allowing her connection that not allowing her connection to the human world to be severed was a sin. Hanyu planned to return to the realm of the gods at the end of Rika's natural life, and thinks that the Hanyu of this world may have done the same thing, which is why she's no longer present. The only way to allow her to come back is to remove the contradiction in this world by killing those who know of this world's reincarnation, which is just Rika's mother, since it was kept a secret. She is only, she's the only one that they have to kill. <clears throat> Hanyu tried to leave this up to Baron Castell's decision without giving her too much information or swaying her in either way, and she'll accept either choice. This world is a world without sin, and even though no one ever had the hardships that led to their closer bonds with Rika, Baron Castell can still find happiness by finding something new. In order to avoid killing herself as Baron Castell and forcing herself to become Rika again, with no memories of her past lives, Baron Castell must mirror the role of Oka and kill her mother. She explains how, by being forced to do that, she is being made to take on the sin herself that her mother acts as a scapegoat for. How incredibly unfair that is to put her in that position. By doing that, the sin continues throughout the generations. It's never truly gone. <clears throat> She has to make her decision by sunset of the next day, or she'll be in this world forever. We then cut to the EDA clinic. Baron Castell wakes up as Rika in her original world, in EDA's clinic, where he explains that Rika has been comatose for nearly a whole month after her bike accident. Baron Castell calls out to Hanyu and asks if the world she was in before was a dream. Hanyu lies and says it was. Baron Castell realizes that she must have killed Rika's mother, then herself, and just can't remember because of how she loses her memories leading up to her death. But remembering that she did that forces her to recall the despair and sensations of that murder, sending her into a despair spiral. Hanyu touches her forehead and uses her power to suppress the agony in her, which nearly suffocates Baron in the process. The club members come to visit, confirming for Baron Castell that everything is back to normal and her loved ones are back again. She tells them about the dream she had, still feeling selfish for choosing a world where they had to suffer in order for them to all be happy together. Reyna and the other and the rest of her friends say that they agree with her decision to return, and that their experiences made them who they are, more alive and realized than their sinless counter <clears throat> counterparts. Reyna plays a game with Candy to try to teach her about the need to accept things as they are and not get caught up in thinking about alternative worlds, which she thinks should only be the concern of the gods and those in higher dimensions. Baron Castell decides to let go and become Rika again, severing the witch aspect of herself from the mortal, in order to find peace in her life. Hanyu informs her that this is her final life, which she will have to accept when she finally dies. Rika briefly te teases Hanyu by saying she won't give her cream puffs, but when her friend suggests getting her a treat, she decides to ask for cream puffs from Angel Moore instead of something spicy like usual. As Rika falls asleep again, she decides to visit her parents' graves later, realizing that Hanyu must have put her in this world to force her to feel sorry for the loss of her mother. And that's it. There you go. That's Saikoroshi. Thank you, Yon. Fantastic work, as always. Give it up. I know that's a lot of work. It's a lot of work to, you know, do all that and to also, you know, contribute to the discussion doc. So thank you very much for doing that, Yon. Um, so yeah, I guess I'll go ahead and, um, just kind of launch into thoughts. Yeah. I thought that this was, um, a really nice way of ending everything. I thought that wrapping things up with, um, arc eight in just kind of a nice, pretty little bow was uh, something, something didn't really sit right with me. Um, I felt like there was more to extrapolate there. There was more to talk about. And that was kind of like, I don't know. I could definitely feel like with arc, arc nine, that uh, Sakuroshi that like, you know, even Ryukishi felt that way and decided to, you know, maybe, you know, talk about a little bit more, extrapolate a little bit more of some of the thoughts, particularly, I'm sure you all picked up on this, but this entire arc feels like a extrapolation of the tip from I forget which one it was, but the uh, a lot of it has to do with the the choosing, especially when Rena talks specifically about it, and it comes up again 
you know, the, the left hand, right hand thing, choose a hand. Oh, you're only upset because you, um, you know, you would only be upset knowing that there was more reward in another or a different reward in another hand by being shown that. That was a tip in one of the previous arcs. I believe, was it arc three? I want to say it was. Arc was it, four. Arc four? Arc four. Okay. I was off by one arc, damn. Um, but yeah, that was, um, yeah, that arc specifically dealt with like the, the idea of choice and um, particularly how it related to player choice um, as far as I was concerned. But it seems like now it's ex being extrapolated out and thought, and thought more about. And it's interesting. Um, yeah, no, this is a really, really, um, really like nice way of, um, you know, ending uh, Higurashi, or at least officially. I know that there's a ton of other stuff to talk about, but, or a, a ton of other like media out there. Um, including an anime. Um, but, uh, yeah, no, it's, there, there's, there's a lot to really like dig in on here. And actually, you know, I mentioned in the previous uh, book club there, uh, for arc eight, there, there was actually, you know, I think that the major sort of thrust of this arc, which is, you know, I, I feel like it's twofold. It's partly, you know, be, uh, you know, be grateful for the, the life that you're living and, you know, maybe not try to focus so much on like, uh, min maxing it <laughs> if we're <laughs> using game terms. Um, but also there is this element of like, um, it's the thing that I mentioned in, in the previous book club, which is, you know, it's not so, and I want to, I want to definitely hammer, uh, hammer home on this. Cause I feel like I might be misunderstood with what I said, which was basically, um, what happened to Decano and how if that hadn't happened to her like a lot of the, a lot of a lot of pain and suffering wouldn't have happened but at the same time like these characters wouldn't have formed such in extremely strong bonds and none of the events that we you know got to you know um you know uh, got to know them over for all of the arcs of Higurashi wouldn't have happened and that's incredibly like interesting to talk about here because with this with Saikoroshi I feel like Ryukishi is saying it's not that it's good that they uh, that you know what happened to Takano um happened it, it's that it's important it's that it matters and that you know I feel like that is incredibly um powerful um to to consider like it's bad things happening it's not like you know, that, that is what should be or what needs to happen, but it happened and that fact matters. And the decisions that we make, the, the, the way that we live our lives, it all matters. And, you know, it, it's not the end. We should maybe not worry about min-maxing and all that stuff. So, um, in that vein, yeah, this, this, yeah. <laughs> I hate uh, visualizing uh, Rika uh, Rika's death at the beginning. That that oh man <laughs> that oh no Wh wow wowie <laughs> that sucked. Uh, I, I was half expecting Jan to show up because Jan's been uh, changing um, uh, their uh, avatar, uh, and I was half expecting to have a <laughs> Rika have a tire mark on her face. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, anyway. Um, so, uh, with that, I guess, I'll, uh, yeah, um, Olo and Talzriel. Hey, Talzriel, you haven't talked much. No, um, I guess kind of the big, um, from my perspective, a lot of, um, I guess it's complicated. <laughs> um, a lot of what I got from this one was kind of, um, that this chapter felt a lot more paradoxical than a lot of the others. Um, that the uh, theme of accepting what you have kind of ran cross purposes to uh, the the narrative for most of Higurashi so far has been fight for the future everyone believes in. Um, and and this is about uh, accept more about accepting what you have and. Uh, in, in a authorial perspective about um excuse me about um lives that you are um that about lessons that you could teach your readers that's well and good but it i feel like it gets a little more scrambled in the context of someone who has been 
uh, living these different lives and fighting to find something better and then being thrust towards, oh, you need to accept what you have. That's I, I just I just want to cut it on that. I think it's more an issue of the past versus the future. This is more of don't wish that things were different to begin with. In both cases, it's go towards a better future. But in this one is, wouldn't it be better if this thing never happened to begin with? I think that's the difference here. Mm. Just because just I don't think that there is a contradiction, really. I'm sorry to cut in on this. I just think it's no, a no, matter no, no. of... I, I think that's a, a good life preserver for me. Thank, so I think I was starting to flail. So, no, you... <laughs> Th thank you for intervening. <laughs> yeah, this this one is more a way of saying y you shouldn't wish that things had been different to begin with. In either case, it's a, you should understand how it is now, why it is the way that it is, and make plans to go forward, not to wish you could have undone what's already happened. Hmm. Yeah, like, um, yeah, like, I, I understand also, like, part of the it feels kind of like a contradiction of like in most of the the main part of Higurashi a lot of emphasis was put on like fighting for change and for future and while this is saying like you have to accept like the past it is a little it, it can be a little strange to have it come at you to be like oh yeah you should definitely accept this stuff that happens even though you've been you've been told that like oh yeah you should fight for everything you shouldn't have to accept it but the it is like the intent is definitely like a thing of like you shouldn't uh you shouldn't wish that the past was different or you shouldn't worry that you don't um that you didn't live like an ideal life or you didn't uh yeah that that you didn't yeah, make yeah. decisions yeah that's where um well this is my actually my first time reading this uh this is where i feel like i'm a contradiction of sorts where like rena is like uh like, okay, Reina in this case, because that's what this version is called. Mm -hmm. She's like, yeah, no, I it, stuff has happened, but you can make a new life in this one that don't, like, cut yourself off from, like, this particular shard. And I'm like, that's a great point. That is, yeah, um, not followed up on. Yeah, like... I, I thought if, that if, was, yeah. Like, if the point was, like, oh, you have to accept the past and move on, like... Uh, that would be a stronger theme if, like, Rika did accept the fact that she died in her, like, perfect world and just kept on going in this one. I thought that's what was going to happen. I thought the Burn Castell thing was being set up so that this version of Rika, like, you know, somehow, like, got the ability to go all the way back. Because am I correct in assuming that this arc was basically set off by the hidden um, uh, fragment, um, the events of the hidden fragment from arc well, 8? Um, with uh, Burn Castell going back in time to tell Takano to, like, hey, you know, do you, I, hey, little kid, do you want to fucking die? <laughs> like, partially, I think. Uh, it's uh, summed up well in that, like, Rika says, like, oh, everyone else got, like, a six in the, uh, during, during their misfortunate moments in their life this time around, which is, like, yeah, I think it's just, this is just a world where, like, everyone had a more peaceful, like, life I, I wouldn't say it's it's probably not literally started by that hidden mm -hmm. fragment but i think it was definitely like a a thing that wormed its way into ryukishi's brain yeah. it's like, hmm, mm -hmm. i should do this yeah but uh, the reasons i stated is why i'm like 50 50 on this arc I, i'm not sure if i like it or dislike it i think um the previous arc is still a better like finale to higurashi oh yeah like yeah. i definitely love uh matsuri more as like a finale finale but Saikoroshi is um it's interesting in that it's a a good arc for like I don't want to stop thinking about Higurashi yet mm -hmm. and like I want to come at it from like a, a different angle at least like a slightly different angle yeah kind of thing. yeah I think that um the what with what happened with uh, like I, I feel like arc nine I feel like Saikoroshi is is more about like sort of taking the lessons learned from Higurashi, uh, which are, you know, fight for a better future. But uh, a lot of that can get kind of lost in, in like the, the overall sort of narrative, um, which is like, okay, fight for, uh, fight for a better future when you have the ability to save scum time. And it's like, <laughs> mm, okay, well, <laughs> that metaphor is like a little, 
I don't know how how well that can be utilized in like you know. I, hmm. Um, but what I'm getting at is basically Arc Nine is basically bringing it down to earth. It's bringing it to a point where it's like, no, 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 you can't do that. <laughs> like, you, you, you've made this, uh, things. Uh, things have happened, and it they are they are. It, it is important that they happened, and they matter, and it is important to accept that they happened and to, you know, keep fighting for a better future and using mm -hmm. the the ideas from previous. Um, arcs and to, to move forward um but and yeah. that's why i like it. Uh, it you're you're totally right though cat you're totally right <laughs> like that's it, uh the more i think about it the more it's like oh man i i kind of this is one of those situations where maybe maybe it all being a dream wouldn't have been so bad <laughs> but which is kind of what i thought was gonna happen actually like i thought it was gonna you know uh, rika was just gonna wake up and oh man what a bad dream anyway <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, another thing, and this is probably very minor, uh, is that uh, what Rena says at the end of like, oh, you know, we we lived a fuller, well, she didn't say fuller lives, but like, she a more lived life in this one than the other one, which I'm like, eh, I, I think you, li you like live a full life in general, no matter what you go through in life, so mm -hmm. that little bit... Uh, yeah, I, I feel like yeah. there was potential for a really strong metaphor with um, Rika. I, I, I don't know, it works for me, because I think just in terms of like having to overcome experiences and change because of that. Like, she had, she didn't have to change as much, is what she was saying. Mm -hmm. I, right. I it guess like one... Uh, uh, I'll be quick. Uh, it feels like it's that thing of, like... It's hard to talk about, like, uh, going through, like, bullshit in life and trauma, because it's like, on one hand, you want to acknowledge that yes, this changed me, and also it sucked. And uh, it, but it also doesn't make me like a bad person. It's like it's a thing of like I shouldn't worry about what should have happened. Like I can't get hung up on it. But it's also a thing of like depending on <laughs> depending on context. Uh, saying that like trauma made you more of like a like a fuller person or a more characteristic person can be can lean into that like oh yeah going through garbage makes you it's like oh yeah this this definitely made me stronger it's like no it didn't <laughs> yeah that's actually <laughs> i think it's just that they, they specifically grew from it in this context like yes. they specifically overcame that not saying that it's good to suffer but that they in that timeline grew as people because of the hurdles they had mm -hmm. not that it justifies it but that's because that's what made them who they are yeah yeah, and there's a difference between, you know, it is, quote, you, it is good that you suffered versus, quote, um, your suffering matters. Mm -hmm. Not only to you, but to everybody, you know, and it's, it's, yeah, I think that there's a vital distinction there. I but, mean, yeah. and for my part, I, I, I didn't exactly like how in the end wrap up uh, when Rika's kind of telling everyone in, the, the home timeline in the Matsuri Bayashi timeline about what what she heard about how everyone went, Keiichi kind of uh, dumps on himself that, oh yeah, the me that didn't go through all of this is is a lame bozo. And <laughs> and I, I didn't really like that because it kind of, um, it, it's assuming that Keiichi didn't like that, that uh, just because it didn't happen the way it did in the familiar timeline where Keiichi ended up in Hinamizawa, that he didn't somehow get that character growth through a, a different route back in Tokyo, that he didn't blow up in another way that uh, kind of brought the information to light and uh, kind of shook him into a, uh, sh shook him out of the bad state he was in. I think that it's important to, uh, I'm, I'm just going to real quick. Um, I read that as not necessarily Keiichi like dunking on that alt version of himself. I read it more as like a dismissive of like, oh, who cares? Uh, which is expanded upon by what Rena says afterward, which is basically just like, you know, it, it's, let's not, you know, it, it's good to not focus on like what could have been. Uh, it's, mm -hmm. I think that was just Keiichi's version of like, dismissing it outright just like oh fuck that guy <laughs> and uh, he could very well be talking more for rika's uh 
sake in that in that moment anyway or magician of words so that's certainly a uh, valid interpretation of it also okay she's an idiot anyway um <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh, i think uh, the one of the things that like early on when uh, rika and uh Rena are like walking home with each other, but she's like, "Yeah, no, she she is still Rena at her core. Mm -hmm. She might not have gone through the same the lived experiences that she did, but she's still the same person at her core." And I'm like, "Oh yeah, that's a great way of thinking about it. It's just like you're always like the person you are at your core, even if your the experiences you make are different." I. I wanted to say I really like Saikoroshi. Um, I think I like it in a sort of different way than I like the rest of Higurashi before it. And I'm not entirely sure what I mean by that, but hopefully somewhere by the end of this rambling thought getting <laughs> dragged out of my brain, I will have figured out some decent way to put it. You can do it, I believe it, in you. It feels in a way a lot more metaphorical, more of like a tone poem with a subject and con and ideas it wants to talk about without necessarily giving answers about. I feel, um, as someone who spends a truly ridiculous amount of time thinking about the past and considering alternate possibilities and ways things have got could have gone and. What if this thing that wasn't exactly my fault didn't happen, or whatever, and extrapolating that to a million other variables flipped back and forth, I really do enjoy reading someone else grapple with those, I guess. And I don't know, I don't I don't know how else to put it. It's just like I I have I have invited Rika to the same support group and we're gonna sit there and drink together and just kind of have some vague poets we want to get out of our brain and she's very successful at getting those out of her brain because we've read like 20 of her poems I really don't know how to put it. I don't know if any of this made any sense at all whatsoever. I like hanging out with the Higurashi gang. I like hanging out with Rika. And I like the subjects here. And I interpreted it as less trying to give definitive answers on these subjects. And more just exploring how these characters would react to these questions, I guess. I think that's a totally valid approach to this too, because you can also and read. I, I really like it in that sense. I really like it in that sense of it feeling more like Burn Castle, I guess, and Hanyu and Ryukishi in some sense, setting down a discussion document on the table in front of the cast and going, the idea of accepting your past for what it is. Give me your thoughts. And this is a vessel for all of them to argue about it. And I like it in that sense as someone who likes arguing about that subject and thinking about it way more than I should. It, it feels a lot more metaphorically driven. I, I, don't, I don't know. It, it feels a lot mm. less literal the way I interpret it, I guess. I don't know. I really don't know. No, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely with you on that one. Like, it's very much using this as a way to explore this idea of like basically she got caught up in a daydream about oh if only this had happened if only this had happened then they yeah. could have all been happier and then be like nope nope that's actually not a good train of thought i'm gonna back out of that <laughs> yeah yeah that's kind of how i read it is i i really do like the idea that it's less to provide answers on the subject because it doesn't feel like Ryukishi himself has perfect answers on that subject. It's more like here's something I've been thinking about. Here's the things, here's different angles that I think about it from, as represented by these characters and the ways that they think about it. And I will now let them yell at each other about it for a little while. <laughs> and you're just gonna sit here with me while I work through these difficult thoughts roiling in my brain. And I'm going to use Higurashi characters to do it because... You're trapped here with me, buddy. Yeah, there's a know. read of um, of this where you can basically look at the the ending of Sekiroshi as fan service, as like 
Oh, you love those characters. You love these characters. You've been here. You you know these characters so much. You want to go back to them, right? You, of course you do. And then, you know, <laughs> Ryukishi in his Ryukishi way gives you what you want, but incredible, like, like darkly tinged. Like another, do another you, finger did you, on the monkey paw curls. Exactly. It's like, did you really want that? Because honestly, I like the idea of Burn Castell being like a, a version of Rika that um, learned how to just you, you know basically started over in that in that loop in that specific in the Sekiro, in the Arc Nine the Sekiroshi loop and just kept going and aged you know with everybody in that loop and you know and, and did it that way. I think it's I... also important that Rika lo Burn Castell loses her memory at the end of that mm -hmm. and doesn't remember what because you, by putting that in a black box you're allowing for a lot of like mystery that could have happened up until that point that would have explained things. Like maybe there was some stuff that we don't know about and we don't know Rika's like exactly what happened with Burn Castell. We don't know exactly what happened to them. So there is a, a little wiggle, wiggle room. The house. Sorry. A meteor could have just hit the house and killed. Yeah, both of them. That, we don't know <laughs> that, you know, we have no idea. Kiyuchi does show up, but it's for fucking um, shooting children, and he misses, and it dings off several lampposts and just strikes a fireplace and sets the house on fire. <laughs> of course he did. Of course. Crazy. You know, you know really? what actually happened? <laughs> Rube Goldberg disaster, and it's all Kiyuchi's fault. I, I'm sending this Ryukishi's way uh, a perfect way of uh, viewing uh, 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 Burn Castell getting sent back to... Uh, uh, their uh, original time uh, they were driving uh, uh, Burn Castell was driving with her mom and her mo they got into a car accident <laughs> her, mom her mom had a kid on her bike <laughs> so it, 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 it's, it rhymes it's cyclical <laughs> it's like poetry it's like which poetry. is really fitting considering we're following <laughs> Frederica Burn Castell who is always writing poems she just does not stop exactly in this world uh Rika decides to become a poet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she didn't even know. Somehow it. it's all cake fuckers' fault. <laughs> so, uh, somehow everything's cake fuckers' fault. And I, yeah. There's also Hanyu in this one, which I feel like is a whole other discussion. <laughs> oh, oh yeah. God. Mm. There's a lot to break down on Hanyu. I'm sitting here staring directly at Gale through the computer screen. <laughs> ow, ow, indeed. <laughs> Ow, wow, 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 Yeah. As, as a heads up, I disagree with everyone. I'm sorry. I love everyone's <laughs> thoughts. But uh, when I, I, I don't want to interrupt because it would just be me disagreeing. But I want everyone else to talk about this. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, it's I, I don't disagree with you, Numbers. Oh, I actually I'm, agree with you. I'm the most correct person. I've never been wrong, not even once. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> I agree with numbers. Do you agree with me also? Do I get that? Do I get that pat on the head? <laughs> pat, pat, pat. I mean, I do you agree with me? Half I agree with Damn you. Damn it! It's okay. Like, we all have different perspectives on this. I'm I'm not... I, I enjoy hearing everyone. <laughs> Who do you not agree with? <laughs> half of me, apparently. <laughs> um, I also don't agree with half of you. I mean, I, I don't want to get into it until, like... We're kind of like further into the discussion. Uh, well, I mean, uh, I, f I feel like the uh, folks who are new to this have already talked, unless I'm mistaken. I would take that as a go ahead. Olo? Yeah, I, I've got more thoughts kind of mixed in with the document topics, so I can come back to those as we pass through those um, through those subjects. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of, um, that, that's kind of what I'm asking for. Uh, Olo, was that? Uh, I was gonna say, like, I don't, I don't mind waiting until there's further discussion, since a lot of my thoughts, like, um, they're they're a lot shorter. Um, mm. So it's just I wouldn't mind if, like, since I added on to a couple of topics, I wouldn't mind if I just like went last or went first or whatever. Uh, whatever. Yeah, whatever, whatever we feel like. Uh, but I think that that is uh, our cue to head over to the discussion doc. Which, uh, yeah, we're we're gonna go through now, and yeah, we're just gonna gonna go through them uh, bit by bit, and yeah. Uh, so we want to start with the importance of acceptance, which I feel like we've already touched on, but uh, yeah, we'll mm -hmm. definitely want to get more into it. 
unless we want to just get that one or what how we how we feeling how we feeling uh no I, mean, I, 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 I think you know we pretty much got it i i just wanted to add in like again like i thought the incident with like you know the accident being thrown into is kind of more of a framing device for exploring that alternative perspective than like like it, we, we we kind of already touched on that like the supposed contradiction or at least how i feel it's not really that contradictory um just how it's like it's not that she has she should have accepted her life in that other world more that that is the other world being considered that she should not be like considering in the first place or it should not be presented to her by someone else depending on how you want to look at it i also had something to add on about this one um i actually really like the ending where everyone's talking about being more human and I have a lot of reasons for this that we'll kind of go into for different perspectives, both meta and within the narrative itself. But um, Keiichi talking about how, like, there are lessons, there, there's, like, a lot of lessons he would not have learned if he hadn't had the chance to experience that. And he would be a completely different person. Like, it is impossible to truly consider, like, the person you would be. And I think everything about the world that she ended up in is an utter contradiction. All of these things are complete impossibilities. And Rika has been presented with this world to make her feel guilty. And then she comes back and her friends are like, we're more human than that. Like, that's not our lives. I, I don't, I don't want that life. I don't care about anything, but like the person I am here now with you and I, because we are literally made of our experiences and there are always things maybe that are like kind of core about people and individuals but at the end of the day like there's the only way that you can exist within sort of like these alternative contexts where you've not experienced these ideas and things is to kill the self that you are today in much the same way that Rika constantly feels like she has to do the the idea of having to accept things is this incredibly destructive thing to Rika, where she is overwhelmed by the idea that she does not deserve to exist in this world if she is unable to accept and erase herself and allow this alternative Rika to kill her. And I find that to be very fascinating because I think this leads back very heavily into how much Ryuki she talks about people are influenced by their experiences like they are made of their experiences like that is his opinion people do not do bad things because that's inherently who they are that happens because of their experience and i think this is an extension of that where he's arguing against this idea that this is just inherently who these people are but rather like these are shadows of ideas that hanyu has created of rika's friends and there's nothing to accept but the life she actually has. And I think it's really cool. I like that. I like that too. And it's something that she actively, I mean, she actively chooses it and she basically, she actively kills that timeline by, well, unless uh, we, we had some of those alternate theories a moment ago, but the default theory is she kills her mother and then herself. So she's put blood on that timeline, her blood, her own blood and her mother's to get back to uh, the Matsuri Bayashi timeline. I, I think that's partially why I, um, I, I would have preferred if this was actually a dream versus like an act, a different fragment, because like. I mean, it, I, I think it is a dream. Like, I don't think it's a different fragment at all. Like, yeah, there's no, nothing. I mean, yeah, like, I, I agree I with mean, you. Hmm. That's a that's an important I, thing. Sorry, I'm gonna jump in real quick. I'm really sorry to talk over people. Um, but Gail, specifically regarding the lore, I uh, is it that like does does Hanyu know what Rika is dreaming about, or do they share dreams in that way? There's no absolute answer, but there, like there is no absolute answer. Ryuki, she did not give one for this. He does not talk about this in any interviews that I can find. He has okay. never talked about his thought process for. Saikoroshi. I look a lot. I do more have because, thought, yeah. more thoughts to present on that in a later seg. Yeah, sure. Yeah. And I just want to really jump in, uh, jump here in uh, real quick because one of the things that uh, that bugged me was that uh, Rika is, speci uh, is specifically told by Hanyu that her head got smashed. Like, yep. Uh, so 
that doesn't make sense with what happens later when she just wakes up after a month. Like that doesn't jive. Like, mm-hmm. so yeah. are you lying to Rika? Never. Like, I, I, I truly think this is just like a construct that Han Yu put within her. Like I, yeah. nothing but that. I, I, I really do. Okay. I really do agree with that read too. When I cite my opinions on Psycho, she read in the context, like a metafictional argument between Ryukishi and Ryukishi and Ryukishi. <laughs> Yeah. Um, I'll also get into that later, but I feel like this entire thing is himself challenging himself for yeah, thinking yeah. that he could ever write a better ending, a happier ending. Like, uh, isn't that, yeah, isn't I that like, like cruel of himself? Okay. Yeah, I like I like that too. Like, I can, I, I can dig this on multiple layers, like an onion, in that I can like the layer of man, Han Yu kind of has weird opinions about the past and growing from it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All my homies hate Han Yu. <laughs> I, I don't... Okay, look, I have complicated feelings about Han Yu. She is a wonderfully written character and is probably a terrible person. All my um, homies hate Han Yu. I, <laughs> she, I'm, she, she's, she's, I'm she's one of your screaming homies. over here, by the way. She is just... I'm one of your homies, Gail, and I have mixed opinions on Han Yu. Han Yu is like a, a, an aunt to me in that I love and hate her at the same time. <laughs> Uh, Han Yu so, uh, is like a funny little rat to me. Just to, uh, I, I, I don't like know what her I mean. theory. I, I would not like oh. her as a person. Yes. Uh, <laughs> yes. Yeah, I agree with Yon. Um, also, this, this, uh, when I said this is covering something, the most important part of the discussion document, I'm really glad that someone added it to the document so that I wouldn't forget. When I said that Saikoroshi is kind of like the dog ending. I mean in the sense of with the sort of read as a construct that Gale gives. In both cases, it is this weird exploration of your brain and your hang-ups as constructed by a funny little dog. That's all I meant. I promise. I didn't have any of the deep thoughts about futility or whatever that Gale uh-huh. added. I just are wanted we, to say funny little dog masterminds. Are we going to talk more about uh, the dog ending stuff? Uh, because I have... Uh, a song that needs to play behind that entire I discussion. Promise, I, I promise for me, it was just a funny little joke about Hanyu as the weird dog. Dang it. I, right. I swear I didn't have deep thoughts on the matter. All right. I can talk more about it. Don't worry. Okay, I can cool, analyze cool, cool. anything. Kat had something to say, though. Yes. Uh, just to very quickly finish my thoughts that I was bringing up earlier. Like, yeah, if you, if you take this as a dream, I like this a lot. If you take it as an alternate world, uh, I do not. <laughs> it depends on how you split that difference. And yeah, and yeah, I totally get that. Yeah, I agree. But I think we just uh, kind of uh, came to the uh, conclusion that maybe that it's very there is actually in world evidence for this being a dream. Yeah. To uh to, ex- to explain why uh it's to go back to what Gail said. You're like your lived experiences makes you who you are. Mm-hmm. That works perfectly if this was a dream world, but if it's in like an actual different world, then it's like it, that kind of muddles that message, like fundamentally, yes. if it was a. Yeah, and I think when it's like point, like when Rika's like, oh, she's lying to me right now, it's less that like it it wasn't, it, it's less in terms of her lying that it was a dream and more in terms of lying that like she experienced it. Because like, even if it is a dream, she still did go through it because mm-hmm. of Hanyu. Like Hanyu still made her go through that. And Hanyu's like, no, oh, that, no, I don't know what you're talking about. That didn't happen. You're, you're just making oh some stuff up. Hate down. Hate down. You. I, okay, I now I'm, now I'm reading this like as girl boss too. <laughs> exactly. Now I'm seeing this as uh, Hanyu just getting super fucking mad that uh, Rika just decided to fuck around with her life and get hit by a car and decided to give her a fucking nightmare for a, a month straight. Jesus Christ. Yeah. Like, <laughs> of Higurashi. Is this Rika had to do cartwheels to get out of this. <laughs> Incredible. Okay, do we want to move on to the next discussion topic or was there a, a, a Tal's reel? Did you want to talk more? Uh um, Hanyu is a gaslighting furry. Thank you, Armored Golem. <laughs> no, I think that was all I had for this point. Um, I was just uh, kind of flagging that, yes, I have more um, points of the sinless world, uh, dissonance points, but t- for the sinless world being a true fragment, although at the same time, Infinity's big, so maybe she's just really good at curating, but we can get to that. 
I I don't know because I mean like there are differences within the world of Saikoroshi that ex I don't know this uh, Gail would be better at wording this than I am there are differences in the setup like the premises of Saikoroshi that match no game board we know of whatsoever and violate like seemingly the rules of game boards in a lot of ways like if it is a fragment it is clearly a heavily manipulated one like i don't believe this is a naturally occurring rarity in the sea of kakar or whatever yes since we're on the subject let's skip forward to the sinless world as an object lesson which is my uh segment on that point um so let, i mean we've already discussed that we think that it's a dream uh that uh, probably hanyu inflicted uh, as an object lesson on ba for Rika valuing her own life after her carelessness in what I am assuming is a natural car accident. I'm not accusing Hanyu of setting up the car accident. I'm just accusing her of... I am. <laughs> driving the car. <laughs> Hanyu is the culprit. Hanyu is driving the car. How can this be? <laughs> what if it was Okanogi? Because she can't drive. <laughs> <laughs> if it was Okanogi. It just Hanyu like, ah! <laughs> Wait, wait, no, it can't be Hanyu. It can't be Hanyu. She's too short. How would her feet even hit the pedals? <laughs> when well, you got hit by the car. Yeah. You need to see to, see, to cause maybe, the um, effects maybe that happen. She's like, maybe she's like leaning down really far. Like she's barely even in the seat at this point just so that her feet hit the pedals. And she's like scrambling and trying to stretch her arms back around the corner to get to the wheel, and that's why she's driving so bad? Think about it. She's driving by feel. <laughs> she's, she's drive vibing. <laughs> Do not let Oyashiro Sama take the wheel. <laughs> I was gonna say, when you got hit by that car, that was when I drove. <laughs> <laughs> See that mark on your face? I made that. <laughs> <laughs> the tire tread. <laughs> But yeah, your my my first point that sub point there was that Hanyu report Hanyu's report on Rika's funeral and the incredibly lethal damage she took uh, exiting the Matsuri Bayashi timeline uh, is what we heard about there. And then she wakes out of a coma in either Matsuri Bayashi or a close parallel. So that's an immediate um, red flag. Uh, people's compl. Uh, the people's complaints about Rika in the sinless world, even in even in the arc, Rika notices, hey, it sounds like they're talking to me, to me specifically. Now, Rika's are Rika's, so there's a good reason for there to be commonality there, but it, it was something that raised my eyebrow. And I think the biggest one is, how does the whole ninth child twist work? It, it's basically saying that an earlier generation Ferude firstborn gender flipped in order for Rika's mother to be the reincarnation, except that that Rika's mother shouldn't be Rika's mother or Rika at all because different people would have come out from that uh, bloodline. Yeah, wait, think about it now. Like, does that even make sense? If if uh, if the Ferrari every if, every generation was born like a single year earlier and it just happened to like I don't know why would, <laughs> that, why would that be a piece on the board Hanyu I have questions <laughs> why would that is, be a piece on the board <laughs> yeah. you, you, like, we haven't gotten Bob, it to it in the Bob, discussion I document no I'm sorry can we, Bob can you have Hanyu answer this right now. Mm, let me go ahead and open up a direct you, I have a lot of opinions about your behavior. <laughs> we haven't gotten to it in the discussion document, but I have literally an entire part of this document that's just me bitching out Hanyu Cinema Stin style for her, <laughs> oh, her no. terrible adaptation of honestly, a Higurashi board game. I honestly, can't go wait. off. Go off. <laughs> like, ding Hanyu on everything that you just said. <laughs> All right. I, I've, got, I've got Hanyu on the line. Uh, did you want to ask Hanyu a question? Okay, first of all, what the fuck? Hello. So true. I understand everything now. I forgive her. I do not forgive her. In fact, I endorse Sorry, all she, of her actions after that. Con, you can go to hell. She's sitting on the washing machine, just. <laughs> hey, hey, I don't. I don't mean to like uh, bring up anything, anything wild here, 
I don't mean to go off super far off topic here, but or I don't mean to go super ahead of ourselves here, but if Han you kind of bad, actually, do you think you is saying something about placing your faith in extra dimensional, possibly alien dog gods instead of the people around you who are real and know your struggle? Mm. <laughs> maybe you can't, can't know. Maybe you can't rely on things that aren't real <laughs> like alien dog gods <laughs> I'm just I'm just saying I'm thinking about it I'm thinking about it I'm, I'm thinking about it I don't know where to make that but and Tal, did you uh when I go ahead with your thoughts I'm sorry we interrupted you <laughs> no 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 it, it's fine um the rest of that segment, I think, is uh, more uh, kind of peters out a little. Uh, so I guess my last point was that um, for all that they, it's trying to make the point that uh, we were shaped by our experiences and that we grew from them, Rene is kind of suspiciously on the ball for not having uh, gone through as much as she did. I mean... Her, her thing has always been insight, which isn't necessarily something that would have to be based in necessarily real-world experience, but that was just another red flag in my book. And and also, the shape of the world itself was, were particular to kind of uh, rebuking Rika. It's one where Rika is completely severed from the network of friends that she has been relying on, or perhaps over-relying on, according to that thesis, bereft of the adoration of the village as the uh, queen carrier, something which, uh, in the narrative, she takes that in stride. She doesn't really, um, that doesn't really bother her. And uh, she is weighed down by the parental oversight she's been, uh, skirting without after her real parents or her parents in her home line die in year three of the curse not a fan of the spanking by the way just not not a fan Elise! Yeah. Elise, parents. Elise, just to you remind you that her parents kind of suck yeah but, but Han, he's like, no, no, you up. need to feel bad. You need to feel bad that they're dead. I'm punishing you for not feeling bad enough that your parents are dead. This is your fault, actually. My homies hate Han Yu. <laughs> Han Yu. Also, I, I just want to, I just want to remind you, Psycho, she means dice killing. With all of the, you know, talk and metaphor and whatever about dice rolls as representative of how pieces on the board of Kakura. Kakara, it's, it's Yon just Kakara, made fun yeah. of me. For my, Goku? Yon made Kakara. fun of me for my pronunciation, which is why I'm sticking on this for a second. Sorry. We're talking Dragon Ball now. Kakara. That's Yon what I said. <laughs> but that aside, that aside, with all of the talk of dice as metaphor for how fragments come to being or like shape themselves, their premises change and all that, this is dice killing. Because it's impossible. It is a dice cut in half to get the result of seven or higher. Think about it. Damn. Not very hard, because if you think about it very hard, you might realize that I'm not actually on to anything. <laughs> I don't know if I'm cooking here. I'm just thinking. I'm cooking thinking with about gas. a lot of... <laughs> what were they cooking? <laughs> I'm cooking and there's toxic fumes in the building. <laughs> What's numbers cooking? And you look at the, the pan and it's just dice with oil. Bro <laughs> onto nothing. <laughs> <laughs> what if you split the dice in half to get an impossibly good result and thus break all of the rules at once? Would you have killed the dice? Who knows? Mm -hmm. Like Roshan. I... I... I've got so much to think about. I've got... I... Is, is, Hanyu, the, is Hanyu the inverse of the um, let, let him cook meme? <laughs> do do <laughs> not let not. her cook! <laughs> do not let her cook. She's gonna write a weird fucking fan. It, it's more like you better cook. <laughs> <laughs> I have those you cook better. <laughs> on you, your Bro, recipe sucks. What you is went. he talking about? <laughs> Let this on man you. cook. <laughs> on you, you went way, way the fuck off the book. What the fuck is this? <laughs> Honestly, I think you might as well go into your uh, cinemas and uh, rant. Please, I feel like we're kind of already there. Yeah. 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 <laughs> oh wait, really? Oh, okay. Um. Well, 
bitching out uh, Hanyu cinema stand style. Content warning for me, bitching out Hanyu. Uh, I start this with fuck you, Hanyu, you bitch. Uh, <laughs> sinless in quotations. Um, mashing I say, the, the Hanyu button on the stream chat, by the way. Just mashing it. Thank you. Song. I did that um, for you, don't worry. I should preface this to say, I do like Saikoroshi. Um, I just have to kick the shit out of Hanyu for acting like this is an ideal world when it's literally an impossibility and everything is fake and alien at the most direct level. Uh, Hanyu's personal lesson to Rika is fascinating because it speaks to Hanyu's utter lack of understanding, her inane conservatism, and even a sense of cruelty that had her ignoring the sense of cruelty that led her to ask her own daughter to kill her. So let's cut the ways. Uh, Dr. Takano was a splendid doctor who built a wonderful village and cured the Singdom. Ding! He was a war criminal, Hanyu. If Xion became the head and Mion went to St. Lucia, they'd both be happy people. Mion would be at complete ease at St. Lucia. It was just a personality problem. They were only happy because of their so-called swap. Ding! Catholic schools are evil, Hanyu. Also, Xion's a fucking bully in this. She's a huge asshole. Yes, she sucks. yes. Yeah, yeah, She's yeah, a yeah, huge yeah. bitch. Mm -hmm. She blamed Rika for her own problems of being yeah. bullied. It's like, oh, how dare you be 11? Like, how dare you have been like 9 and 10 and now 11 and been a little... <sighs> Satoko <laughs> is also a little bratty princess. Come on. <laughs> I'm sorry. Just I'm fucking just, honey sucks. I'm just imagining uh, Rika beating the shit out of Satoko with a chair and just everybody, uh, like all of us on the sidelines, like being like, hold on, hold on, let her cook. Let her cook. <laughs> truly, truly. I love this for her. I, I, sorry to interrupt, but I also <laughs> want to kind of highlight uh, that uh, we never really, I mean, of course, Mion's not here. We never get Mion's perspective on whether she's happy at all at St. Lucia. Mm -hmm. Probably not, because, I mean, Xion and Mion have their personality differences, but they're a lot alike. Yeah, yeah. And like, the main dumbass. Yeah, and I, I would say, like, I know, like, probably technically they they swapped at birth, but they swapped, like, at the tattoo thing. But, like, my reading of this is, like, it, this, no matter who was chosen to get the tattoo one would always be left out and the other would always be the only one kept in the circle. Mm -hmm. So no matter what, like it's always one twin would be the scapegoat and they can no longer trade between who has this to be the scapegoat. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so I find it incredibly shitty upon you to like present this as like something good. I, I hate her. I mean, all my on it on you. Uh, thinking about it now, like I'm so glad that we we were doing this because on its face, it's like you know just playing playing that arc was just like oh there's it feels like there's more here, but for what it is, okay, all right. But now that we're opening the fucking door and it's just Han you in there, like just fucking everything up. It, it's like yeah, like presenting this this fragment, this world. As though the dam construction is a good thing, that it's a six on the die, is so on its face fucked up. <laughs> it's like incredible. Like, um, I it, it, there was it, it, there was a bit like weeks or months ago or whatever where me and Gail were talking about Saikiroshi and. I said something like, I really like Saikiroshi, and then Gail was like, well, I like Saikiroshi if you read it in a certain way, which is that <laughs> it's primarily a con construct by Hanyu and exposes all of Hanyu's character flaws and all that. And I was like genuinely taken aback that there was another way to read it, because that is <laughs> always how I read this, is that Hanyu has medals to a truly unbelievable extent, because a lot of these things that have changed are not... They're not pieces. They're not things that change in fragments. They just aren't. That's not in the construct. Not not in the contract, I guess, of what a fragment is. Yeah, Ugh. I I like literally said that because unfortunately I engage with uh, Twitter sometimes because I, I was uh, desperate for communication that thankfully the book club has uh, reduced the need for. But essentially people... I would just get people who would fucking name search stuff and bitch me out about saying these things. <laughs> I'm just like, really? Yeah, fucking hate I, Twitter. Gail. I'm trying. I I think I'm saying useful things. No, apparently not. Gail, I like, would like uh, that is. Uh, let me let me. <laughs> I think I speak for everybody in this in in the 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 Higurashi book club when I say that is fucked up. You are. Mm -hmm. 
in, an incredible source of information for everything regarding all of these topics. And you have provided so much valuable fucking insight. And this, like, uh, you have completely changed, like, how I viewed this arc in such a fundamental way. And I am glad for it. I'm here for it. I am very thankful that you are here. <laughs> and uh, holy <laughs> shit, if people are giving you shit on Twitter, fuck them. <laughs> like, fuck uh, them. I Yon has been like, just stop using Twitter. Just stop using I, Twitter. Stop using Twitter. <laughs> I'm like, I, the I block know. button. I think yeah. what I said a minute or two ago, somewhere else, was along the lines of, there's like six ways you can read Saikoroshi, and most of them kick ass in different ways. And then there's like one or two of them that suck balls. <laughs> it's so true. Um, please continue but, cooking, please. Yeah. Um, oh my god, it's all so good. Um, let's see. Reyna is happy and her family never moved and never got divorced and everything is perfect for her. Ding. The idea that they're leaving the village was the first scene is insane. Ding. Even if they'd left Hina Mazawa, she presumably, like, she apparently doesn't have Hina Mazawa's cis syndrome. So nothing would have happened even if she did move away. Ding. Ding. Ding, Hanyu. I hate her. Um, <laughs> Keiichi never shot any kids because, oh, I guess he just pulled himself up by his own bootstraps. Uh, Literally what? Whatever. <laughs> like, ding, uh. not how the school system works on you. Um, Satoka has a good relationship with her stepfather and no trauma. Ding. Hanyu, she was abused by every single one of her stepfathers before this one and also her mother. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. Uh, from the text, Hanyu says, we can't be selfish. Uh, I'm sorry. No, no. Reina says this. This is about the dam. Reina said, we can't be selfish when it comes to helping the nation grow. I don't really understand, but apparently the government people were really nice and talked to us a lot about it. Dang, Hanyu! The many hydroelectric dam projects during the Showa era were incredibly destructive to both the people and the environment, displacing a great deal of people from their ancestral homes for no other reason than being an energy fueling system that ended up being effectively useless to the broader population of Japan. Like, when they're like, oh yeah, it's this is for the nation. No, they found recently it doesn't really help because most, the, the dams have not helped. And even by the 80s, they knew this. So uh, yeah, Hanyu, um, proven conservative. <laughs> um, that Somehow means that the- we knew this. I think. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, there's also, oh, the Hojos didn't get ostracized. Ding. The Hojos were already in duress due to being poor at the time. They weren't able to pay their council dues. And the only reason they took money, uh, this was the only reason they took money to aid the dam project was because they weren't getting enough support from the village. Why don't poor people just buy more money? Quote Han Yu. Uh, Rita was, was always a little princess and people bully her because her friends went away. Ding. Go fuck yourself, Han Yu. That's all I said there. <laughs> Rika would be happy if she just stopped being a witch. Ding on you. First thing that we see of her see of her father is him beating her. Her mother can't fucking cook. And she feels like she has to hide everything about herself and her identity for the sake of feeling even a small amount of comfort in a terrible situation. That's all of the cinema sin things I did. I'm sure I could find more if I went and reread it. But essentially, this is a false world. It is a complete impossibility. It, it, and it's very core to me. This is like horrifying. And, because, like, and another thing, like me and Yon uh, discuss, this is gaslighting. This is classic fucking gaslighting that Hanyu is putting Rika through. And it's horrifying. And I really, really like that. And that's why I like what her friends say to her at the end because Reina being like, it's okay. It's okay. I feel like a person. I feel like I am a human as the person that I am right now. I think that helps Rika a lot because she was completely losing herself, feeling like she couldn't be a person. And, you know, uh, fuck on you. <laughs> I just want to say, um, I'm totally appreciative of, of all that. I only take a, a, only take issue with one thing. Um, this is not CinemaSin style because it's genuinely funny and informative. Um, mm -hmm. You're gonna yeah. have to. You're gonna have to go back to the drawing board on that one and just get uh, like most I'm of sorry, it wrong. I, failed. I was trying so hard. <laughs> Ding! In this scene, Hanyu is not giving the lap dance. Oh no! Something. You did it! You did the thing. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's, 
I have not seen a Cinema Sins video before. Is, oh, that, don't do not change. Do not. <laughs> that's from like that's from one of their very early videos, and it was criticized at the time, and it's just insane. And then they put it on T-shirts and stuff because they refuse to learn anything and love to market their mistakes and oh. bad opinions as things. Bob to suffered for us. Bob, Bob is our savior. Like he suffered for our sins. Like I'm sorry, Bob. I tried to watch your Cinema Sins uh, Sins video. I, I appreciate them. I watched like I think Kill one you. minute, and then I was like, I think I'm gonna die. So I just uh, no. Kill you. I told. I totally. I don't think I've talked about this. Oh, actually, in my latest video, I did. But basically, like, there's a reason I I, I don't like. You know, I haven't made that a thing. Like, even mm -hmm. though a lot of people seem to like those videos, it's like, no, I'm not doing that to myself. You know, for the, the way you feel about like watching them. Uh, I was feeling that while doing them, and it was just like, oh my god, this is actively making me lose faith in humanity. <laughs> and yeah, it's it's just hostility, and it's miserable. It's 4chan era stuff. It's also it's incredibly weirdly gross shit. It, like yeah, like what? Why are you? There is a joke in the latest video that I'm still not over. I'm still shocked that it's a thing, and uh, you know, I'm even thinking about doing another one um, after this to uh, their video on, um, what is it called? Uh, the Babadook. Because guess what? Oh, Jesus. They viewed the Babadook as not a metaphor. <laughs> their, oh. One of their criticisms of the <laughs> end like was like, first... why don't you kill the monster though? <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, why? What now? Anyway. I always think of the Babadook as an easy way to be like, here's how you read symbols. <laughs> Oh. Baby's first symbolism exercise, and they it's didn't really, fucking yeah. get it. Um, I did want to say, goats, like, goats, goats, one all more goats. thing about the topic here. Mm -hmm. Rika being bullied and kind of like Hanyu and other characters blaming her for it is very fucked up considering she not only is punished more for being, like, a so-called bully in the scenario, but also, like, um, Ryukishi literally says that the first horror experience he had in his life was being bullied and abused by his friends. So it's really obvious to me that, like, he feels this way because of trauma. Like, and he actually agrees with Rika. He doesn't agree with Hanyu. Mm -hmm. There's even a, a section. I, I took a picture of it where, or a screen cap of it where it, like when she talks about how um, she was getting in trouble for like uh, for <laughs> attacking Sadako, it was that thing of like um, it's like uh, when the bullied kid occasionally bullies back, this is what usually mm -hmm. happens after all. Should I call it collateral yeah. damage of the bullying? Yeah, like, yeah, man. <laughs> it sucks so hard. All my homies hate on you. <laughs> That's and my this. catchphrase today. See, was the original arc, or is the the side story arc about Hanyu's origin story? It was that written by Ryukishi, or nope? Okay, he All gave right. some general info for it, but that's it. Okay, because I'm genuinely interested in like that origin story and what exactly happened there, but. If, All I know is there's yeah. aliens involved, and I refuse to learn anything else about it because it's way funnier just thinking, just knowing it as the one with the aliens. <laughs> I think it might be best just going off of what little you were given here, and then imagining the rest yourself. That's usually yeah, how it goes. Most of like the side writers just aren't very good. I feel like mm. Tal, uh, you were saying something. Sorry, I cut you yeah. off. No, no, no. Um, that's fine. Um. Shoot, I think I, <laughs> I think I lost the thought. Oh no, no, no! Um, it was about um, about how uh, Rika was getting bullied for what alternate world Rika did. Which I mean, for uh, I had mentioned that it, the uh, uh, that uh, the criticisms were tailored to hit at things Burn Castle did, but at the same time they're attacking her things that Burn Castle quite literally did not do and does not remember doing. Yeah, that's true. Um, at the same time, you know, I don't know how they would really know I mean, that. Yeah, obviously, uh, the the people in the world would have no way of knowing that. But it's just the layer that um, she's suffering for something that uh, 
isn't her fault. Yeah, that's not her fault. Right. Yeah. And the other thing that just stands out to me is like, they're bullying a kid who was probably like nine or 10 when all of her yeah. parents left. Yeah. And like Mia, uh, Shion, who is like, you know, 14 or 15, is joining in and approving this. Which is something that Mion would never do because Mion ensured that no kids ever bullied or hurt Satoko. So it, it's really horrifying, that situation. Especially since, like, I don't think Shion would have approved of them bullying uh, Rika personally. Yeah, because, like, there's a, that added element of, like, this Mion isn't Mion, it's Shion. But like, would she, would even Shion do that? I don't. Yeah. I don't think so. No, yeah. Shion's I, I, thing for um, her like, her, uh, her thing with Satoko is like it was tied to Satoshi. It wasn't just because Satoko was a, a kid, you know. Yeah, a lot of Shion's anger was directed more at like her own family and like. Mm -hmm. And she has no reason for that here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. She's normal. On you, you're a bad fanfic author. <laughs> Hate her. Yeah, also, wouldn't Satoshi be a little bit more protective of uh, uh, Satoko? Uh, or, did I say it, Satoshi? I meant to say Satoshi. You know, with the phrasing of bad fanfic author, this made me imagine it as like Hanyu posts on AO3, like, here is my uh, Higurashi <laughs> fix fic. I, um,. I, I like Higurashi. I liked Rika a lot. Um, but I think that there's just I think that they do some bad things in it, and I'd like to write this story where none of them do bad things. Here's my fix fic where they're all nice to each other. And then down in the comments there's just Gail's page long review. This shit sucks. I hate <laughs> I you. wouldn't do that because You're I get too strong. angry to read fanfiction, I'm sorry. Yeah. I, I write fanfic, but I cannot read fanfic, unfortunately. I just imagine it. I just I imagine it. Gail has right. standards. <laughs> I yeah. imagine it this way. Most of my fanfic is just original fa original fiction that I was desperate to get other people to read. <laughs> mm -hmm. The I'm, single I'm... comment is from Rika and it just says sucks. <laughs> it sucks, bro. God, I oof, I have thoughts about that kind of thing. Just, Listen, just to just, do just... what everyone else does and write fanfiction and change all the names. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I I, uh, I I have done that, um, but also people do not want to read original fiction usually. Whereas people in fandom are like, oh yeah, I'll, I'll read this if it has like my favorite characters or ships, which is what makes it really, <sighs> unfortunately, kind of like appealing to try to do. Even though most of the time, no one will actually engage with it. Is anything sorry i i'll stop talking about fan fiction it's just, it just makes me sad no 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 it totally makes sense uh, also i would add to that rika reviewing um hanyu's uh, shitty fan fiction with chair emoji chair emoji chair emoji oh, God. Uh, thank you <laughs> dohi I... uh, uh dohi also really quick is so fucking out of character here she's not even the same character what are you doing right well also <laughs> and satoshi is like you know satoshi is satoshi but like i also find it interesting because hanyu didn't really like know or like get to know satoshi that well i guess satoshi's and just it, kind of there satoshi is just kind of like nothing he's just nothing he, he's like he's, not a he's like an m m if we're if we're if everyone's a candy he's an m m he's just like fucking uh, <laughs> like not even a mini m m right not even a peanut butter m m not even a uh, you know any of the good like the, you got okay okay uh here we go um all uh here's my fanfic it's all of the characters but they're candies so uh, uh Mion is uh uh probably probably a mm, th ooh, three musketeer like candy. Yeah, maybe something like that that's like a little she's spicy a, she's a green starburst Ooh. There you go. And Shion yeah. is a different green. Shion's a red hot. Shion's a red no, hot. No, Shion <laughs> is the green M and M asking you to get Bambi too. <laughs> That's specifically that one. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Yes. Has a Kit Kat because I just like Kit Kats. <laughs> yeah. Kat, yeah. Good for her. Greena. <laughs> Greena. Greena. <laughs> New character I just made up for my fanfic. Oh shit! Um, Hell yeah. I'm gonna call numbers Greena from now on. Greena. Mm -hmm. I'll accept it. I'll <laughs> add it to my list of two dozen names. Who's a Twix? Um, I guess you could do the joke oh. of Shion and Mion being a Twix with left Twix. Yeah. And right Twix. 
<laughs> if only she wasn't the green M&M asking for Bambi too. It's true. Mm-hmm. That, that is canonically the the the, solu- mm-hmm. the answer to that question. Yeah. Han used okay. a fucking moldy fucking uh <laughs> fucking uh what what are they, what are they called? Uh, Mon- uh, Han used a, a moldy fucking uh uh uh, uh apple. That's it. Here's my Han used a box of nerds that you forgot about 2 years ago. You're sorry. Right. Thank you. Here's my <laughs> for how we handle Hanyu once and for all. Okay? With a chair. Girl basement. <laughs> girl basement. We give Throw her, her into the girl basement. <laughs> we give her Gate a lock, big girl bottle of water and it's a bit too big. There's too much water in the bottle and we let her play around with it. <laughs> for a moment I thought you were talking about waterboarding that I remembered. <laughs> for a moment. Oh no, I'm not even no. I don't know. I wouldn't go to Guantanamo Bay about this numbers. <laughs> <laughs> I was I thought you were going with the the um the the uh, drinking the gallon of milk until you fucking vomit. Um <laughs> But no, bottle dog. Yeah, bottle dog on you. Absolutely. Fucking just, <laughs> just, just, just stun her. Just, just we'll make her normal. She'll get back up and be like, dang, I really understand now. I'm just going to make you her- become normal. Said Rudy <laughs> San Caden says Detroit become human. <laughs> Perfect. When you were stunned by the exploding bottle, then you will realize. <laughs> when you exactly were stunned by you. the exploding bottle, that's when we hated you. <laughs> All righty. <sighs> Uh, let's move on to another topic. Uh, would, would, uh, what, what, what's a good one to move on to? Probably after, um, someone, uh, uh, suffering a, a, uh, something that befell them, well, like with a bottle and a dog, Rika's bike accident. Do we want to talk about that? Uh, Jan, did you want to? Sure. Yeah. This one was, I, I kind of can use this as a segue to talk about my weird, like similarities with this thing. Just in general, like, okay. First off, I had a bike accident kind of like that when I was her age also. Uh, I wasn't riding home with my friends. I didn't really have any, <laughs> but I was riding home and I definitely got hit by a car. And then it, like the description of her kind of flying through the air, I was like, hmm, yeah, yeah, no, I've been there. I've been there. Uh, and when I hit the ground, I had this really weird sense of deja vu. I don't know what to do about that. Uh, you know, things kind of got fuzzy there. But like, just in, it's it's just it's funny how I'm like I already relate to her so much on top of everything else. It's like you you put my fucking bike accident in there too, dude. <laughs> I don't know what the hell Ryuki she's doing, but he keeps reaching into my brain and putting it into his words. I'm like, dude, how? What? It's, it's, oh. it's wild. One I thing I liked about that. Oh, go ahead. Oh, please go ahead. Please go ahead. I wasn't going to say anything useful. <laughs> I wasn't going to say anything useful either. But what I was going to say was basically like when during that description, when she's been hit by the car, there's a quick moment where she's like, and I smell the pavement. And I was like, Wait, OK. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. What? what did, she get- she, did you get hit by a car? <laughs> Maybe. Are you, you, know, you, I've... Are you Stephen King? He did I've, mention. Oh, I'm sorry. He he did mention that the fingernail thing was based on a personal experience. Oh God, uh, I don't like that. I know that. Hopefully, accidental. Oh. It was accidental, but okay. he said it was very like terrifying and painful. Yeah, yeah so, man. Uh, Jesus, dude. Jesus. Uh. Um, I was just gonna but say. Yeah. It, oh, sorry. Go ahead. I was just going to say like one tiny little tidbit to compare and contrast with Yawn, I guess, for comedic effect. I've never been hit by a car, but one time an old dude did try to kill me with his car. I didn't get hit, though. That's normal. <laughs> Was it Hanyu? <laughs> I, yeah. No, I don't think so. <laughs> Sorry. Are you sure? It's a very short story, but yeah, one time some old guy tried to kill me with his car. And to this day, I still don't fully understand why. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have any idea who he was. And when Hot he man, missed you, he went after me. Yawn. <laughs> Sorry, Yon. He became the scapegoat. I mean, from what I gather, I think Yon's bike story probably happened before my story. I'm just imagining the uh, monster from I was Follows, like but it's an old man in a car. <laughs> I was like 10 or something. But yeah, I was, Thank you. I was out walking my dog or something when I was like 10. And I brought the dog back in, but I was still outside for a minute. And this dude speeds up on the road nearby. He sees me, locks eyes with me, and I swear, turns straight for me with, like, malice in his eyes. And I, like, jump out of the way. And I swear, I look back at the guy as he drives off. And I swear he looked back at me and, like, shook his fist. I have no fucking clue what happened there. 
Hmm. Really disappointed Genu you didn't die. Sorry. I, what? I mean, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> what the <laughs> fuck? <laughs> Gail. Jesus, Gail. I didn't know we had that kind of animosity between us. That's yeah, Gail, Gail, no. I'm sorry, my, my hatred Gail. of Hanyu accidentally got reflected yeah. onto you for a second. I was like, Gail, that's not, the, the <laughs> like, numbers whoa. isn't Hanyu. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. I'm sorry. I, I need to be reminded Not yet, anyway. <laughs> oh, God. It's a matter this of time. Really, this is if a really... If you become Hanyu, we'll kill you, okay? <laughs> okay? I get it. That makes sense. This is a really weird story, and I've told this to people before, and the best theory we've come up with is that he, like, thought I was one of his gang stalkers or something. That's the best guess we've come up with. Have you considered maybe you had Hin Hinamizawa syndrome? And uh... <laughs> I don't think so. He was trying to help you. He was trying to help the you. Car? The car? Yes. <laughs> uh, he, <laughs> he, he, he knew you needed a ride. Listen, he wasn't crashing into you. He was crashing to, into a man with another knife. <laughs> oh my god, he was going to isekai me into the para paradise dimension. He was going pa to send me to Saikoroshi. Paradise? Uh, <laughs> Bob. Hey. All throughout, all throughout my whole <laughs> fucking spiel about Saikoroshi <laughs> as dice killed arc, dice killing arc. But the dice are killed, which is why it's the impossible one. I was per I was very carefully trying to dodge around a Yu-Gi-Oh reference because there is also something that's vaguely like that. There's a bit where two people are playing a game and they have to roll one dice, and whoever gets the higher number loses. Or yeah, whoever gets the higher number loses, and Yugi rolls a six and then the guy's like ha you'll never defeat that or whatever so, so he throws the dice at his head and it splits in two and one side shows a six and one side shows a one and they count it as a seven and that's how how he wins so what i'm taking from this is that hanyu is blue eyes white dragon um yes and that she's fucking useless and only <laughs> loved by nostalgia bait Except she's the nostalgia bait. Except I, I have. Hmm, we can't go off on this. I will disappear for, for that, me save, thousands of years. Save it for the Yu Gi Oh! <laughs> book club. Before We're not we, doing uh, a fucking Yu Gi Oh! book club. We can't do that. <laughs> Before we lose the plot a bit, is we there anything die. else in the document we need to discuss? Oh, oh there's a lot. Right. Is yeah. there anything else with Yan on this topic? I wasn't done. Yeah, she was. Oh my even god, it is shit. So this sorry. document's also just really long. Sorry. Much to Sorry think for about. Sense. Please go ahead, Jan. Please. I, I care what you say. Same. Basically, I was saying it's just it's really it, it was God. really wild how like how much of this is predicated on dissociation, depersonalization, like weird, you know, PTSD guilt and blaming yourself and like trying to shut yourself down for the sake of others and feeling like it's your fault that you know people can't be happier it's like okay it, even if they're happy right now it's like oh well they could have been happier if this and that and you know uh, it's just so much about basically trying to scapegoat yourself and try to take so much onto yourself to somehow make others happier and better and like you need to take this on you have to suffer to make everything else better like i was it's this very real you know, broken logic that you get stuck in, like, you know, it, it can happen to anybody, but especially when you have PTSD from, you know, childhood trauma, it's, it's very real. And it was wild because I was going through that exact, you know, brain loop while reading this, not because of this, but just like parallel to it. And I was like, whoa, oh, fuck, man. <laughs> it's wild. It is wild. Like, I, it, it, it's just, is really weird how like, he can take these very specific, at least it feels very specific these experiences that I've gone through that I've continued to go through even now. And it's like, it's in this thing that was written over a decade ago. He keeps doing this to me. It is wild. And it's just like, I keep finding more reasons to relate to Rika. And it's like, it's interesting. It's, it's good. It's very well written, I think, but it's also very, it just, it, it just, it's, it just keeps taking me off guard. You know how relatable it can be, and I, I don't know, man. <laughs> it's 
it's, it, I don't know, maybe it's, it sounds weird in like abstract to say, like, oh yeah, I really relate to the one where she gets knocked into another world and has to kill her mom to leave. But it's like, you know, <laughs> the, these, these struggles of constantly like shutting yourself down within yourself, trying to be like, just, just stop feeling, just, just accept that you have to have this entire life and everyone else is going to be happier this way. Like this very, you know, obviously on the face of it, broken logic, not true, not the right thing to do but like in that moment it is sometimes very hard to break out of it and you kind of feel like you like these it, there's so many instances i noticed in it where it's like she's getting stuck into these you know trains of thought that are obviously not true but like she's just so stuck in her guilt and her struggles that she can't like where she's like, oh, well, I don't deserve to have this happy experience. This isn't my body. Like, especially that, like feeling like a, a different entity from what, from your body. Like I, that's not a thing that I see people talk about much. I'm like, yeah, I've been, I've fucking been there when I was her age. I felt that way. Like, you know, oh, this body belongs to someone else. I just happen to inhabit it. And like these experiences, that's not really happening to me. I'm just kind of here, but I just have to shove myself down and try to, become this and like the only way to be happy is to like break your brain into thinking that you are that when you're not and also this you know of course very real struggle of if i am too honest then i'm gonna get everything taken away from me i'm gonna be put in a fucking mental asylum or something like that that is a struggle i think that you know is very valid in that instance that just like I mean, it's good that he shows it there because that is a thing that real people struggle with all the time. Of like, this is a thing I'm going with, I'm going through, and the reason I'm not opening up about it is because if I talk about it, I'm gonna lose everything. Mm -hmm. And like, yeah, like it works in this specific, you know, fictional story, and, it, and it's real in real life too. It's a thing that is a struggle. And I think it's even like probably even worse now that we have even worse mental care. It is, <sighs> but you know, it, it's just. It's wild to me that he can take these experiences and kind of put them together in this way and present it back to me before I even like had this thought. It's, it's I, don't, I think it's, it just shows how good he has at writing this stuff with compassion. Do you feel, sorry. Uh, yeah. I was just going to ask, do you feel um, comfort knowing how old this, this story is? I mean, but I guess there's... if I think about it, it's like, it's obviously not a struggle that began with me. It's a struggle that other people go through, have been going through for a very long time. Hmm. It's, a, it's a struggle that other people can relate to very much. It's like, it is, it does make me feel seen. And I'm sure it's made plenty of other people feel seen as well. Hmm. And I'm sure that, you know, people were feeling this way long before he ever wrote it. And it does, it, it does feel good to have it kind of be a thing that existed before I experienced it or even while I was experiencing it, but before I'm reflecting on it now, it's, it's good that it was, you know, put together as it was to indicate that other people have felt this and also feel this way about it. Actually, let me check something. Hold on. When was this written? 2000, like, uh, 2006, 2007. I'd, um, i just take the second to say that Yon is definitely not the only one who resonated with these aspects of Saikaroshi. Mm -hmm. They resonated very strongly with me, because me and Yon have a great deal of parallels in a lot of ways, you might understand. Some of them are a little uncanny, in fact, but... This story came out when I was ten years old. I was her, I was her age. Jesus. <laughs> Can't believe that you would have done this. I can't you believe you've 10. done this. You would have been you know, 10 years this old. Was, this would have been not long after the time that I did get suspended for attacking my classmate. I've been there too. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, that's a specific uh, experience I also had. Mm -hmm. I, didn't I got many trouble, suspensions. But <laughs> many. something like that happened. <laughs> yeah, I didn't get suspended, but I did get in... Uh, I got. I got in trouble... Or I raising my voice at another student. 
when I, she put gum in my hair on the bus. Anyway, I got like every single punishment under the sun, several times over, many times over, many, many. I was a terrible student. Um, <laughs> I got expelled eventually. Mm. Uh, I sucker punched someone in the face and they started to bleed. Nice. <laughs> Hell yeah. I strangled a kid. Oh. Mm -hmm. was cool. I just got like really mad one day and tried to bite my friend. We were still friends <laughs> afterwards. <laughs> oh, I also friends. beat the shit out of my uh, classmate with a chair. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> this this now, arc does it resonated make it, with me. <laughs> does it make it any funnier if I say that I strangled that kid because he insulted Tsunade from Naruto and I was defending her honor? <laughs> <laughs> that does make it funnier. That makes it pretty good. way better. That I I understand. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you you just went like mommy and just sm started smacking someone. <laughs> Are you talking no, about I... my mommy? <laughs> my I wife. I... You can't say this about her. <laughs> I, it wasn't like quite the Rika thing, but I did get in a fight with a kid where I ended up hitting them with a chair. Oh, ah, well, there you go. There you go. Like. Like folding one of those metal folding chairs together and whacking them with it. I did do that. Oh, oh WWE style? Kinda, yeah. I was like 13 or something. I don't <laughs> even remember the context of this fight. I got in a lot of fights. <laughs> you probably just did it just because, because it seemed fun. I <laughs> No, I'm sure there was some reason. It probably wasn't a good one. Childhood rage has never originated from anything bad. Not at all. We should probably get back to this document. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry, my point is basically, it, I really relate to this. It's I didn't expect to, but I did. Do we want to talk about identity struggles, disassociation, and DRDP? Yeah. Oh, Jan, I'm good you... at those. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Jan, what else did you want to say about that bad, st that bad boy stuff? Uh, I think that's pretty much it. Just uh, that segues into the other identity struggles and DRDP stuff. How you have or you say it, right? I, I think that I think that's a good segue. Doctor Doctor Pepper. I have several things that I wrote about this topic. I am very educated in this topic. Um. Doctor Deadly Premonition. Oh uh, <laughs> yes. Um. So depersonalization is a huge thing to note here. Uh, Rika says, uh, I wasn't, uh, being alone wasn't sad anymore. I'm not Rika, this isn't my world. This isn't a place I can live. The only way I can exist here is if I'm dead. It, it, I should say that's my kind of like phrasing of what she's doing. I find this to be familiar at the level of Cotard's delusion, which is this uh, form of psychosis where you believe that you are dead, your body is putrefying, you're missing like uh, body parts or mm -hmm. limbs. Um, and like this idea that you're existing in a world that is just like inherently untrue. And the reason I know about this is because I've personally experienced this. I obviously, you know, don't need to go into too much detail about it because uh, very, a lot of stuff there. Um, but it, it is just like this, I feel like. Uh, Rika feels that she's not Rika. She has turned this, the Rika of this world into a corpse. Uh, with PTSD, like psychoses are not uncommon at all. That can oftentimes be especially something that comes, um, that becomes a part of uh, complex PTSD, in fact, due to just the fact that it's all about the fragmentization of your identity. Um, and so like different people will experience different kinds of delusions or psychosis, per, for instance. Due to Rika's many, many deaths, it makes sense that she relates herself solely through the existence of like her friend's experience and her friend's grounding her. Without that grounding, the world becomes completely derealized. It's no longer a place that exists and she is not someone who can exist within it. She may be jealous of the Rika of this world at some levels, but she is also unable to understand this Rika's life because they are utterly different people, completely defined by different experiences. And the sense that her life is nothing more than an inconvenience to not just this Rika, but everyone in this world. 
Um, continuing the Cotard's delusion thoughts, I quoted a part here. Rika says, um, when that ball hit her, I think Rika Furude died. And the doctor responded, well, if that's all it took to die, nobody could play dodgeball. If you've died back then, wouldn't that make you a corpse? There is a mockery here and a failure to understand how psychoses present themselves. Even in Rika or Bern Castle's worlds, to present it as false, the refusal to engage with her internal world at all is an immense cruelty. And this is the very kind of thing that causes people to retreat into themselves, which can lead to greater depersonalization. It can lead to suicide attempts. It, it can lead to just a complete collapse of the idea of a self. And it, it speaks to me as a sense of just how poorly treated uh, mentally ill people and especially mentally ill children are in these contexts where he's just like, oh yeah, you know, we'll just send you to a hospital and she knows she's just going to be institutionalized, much like Reyna was. Like, she knows what Reyna's experience was and <laughs> she realizes that's what she's facing and that's horrifying. Um, I feel that much of Hanyu's treatment of Rika here uh, feels similar to how abusive parents convince their children that their situations are not abusive. They basically make them believe gaslighting, but also they're just kind of creating a false reality for them, which is another thing that kind of leads to derail derealization. Where in the other world, like even though Rika had trauma, she was no longer being like abused by a parental figure. Um, and her friends like Sotoko, who were experiencing abuse and other things, like she could ground herself within that. She could kind of say, I'm real because there's someone like me in this world. These experiences are a reality and I can definably prove that self, prove that to myself. But in this world that she's now in, it's like Hanyu is literally just presenting her this thing where if you simply molded yourself to the situation, nothing bad would happen. Everyone would be happy because you are no longer causing them inconvenience. You're no longer acting out. When Rika's like thinking about how she's going to be like the daughter that her mother wanted, it reminds me going back to the journal entries that her mother wrote about beating her and being angry that she wasn't like that, that she was such a strange and precocious, precocious child. And the fact that Rika knows that her mom would beat her and be angry at her, and she's scared of being sent to the hospital, so, um, you know, she just gives her mother what she thinks she wants, and everything's fine and happy, and she doesn't get beaten. And, uh, <laughs> that's a lot. Like, a child doesn't break the rules, a child does what other people tell her to do, a child, she would be... She's completely disallowed her own language, which is, again, the same as dying. It's as if you're speaking a language that no one else can understand. As if when you speak, all that's coming out of your mouth is just roots and branches, and people look at that as something to be disgusted with. Um, I also feel as if um, the treatment of Rika at the hands of her friends in this world and the doctor are deeply reflective of how Rika was scared people would treat her in her original fragments, like how adults and everything else, um, like they would push her off. Like her friends only believed her after they had resolved all of their own problems. They never could have listened to her if they were, you know, trapped within Hinamazawa syndrome and other things. And she knows that, and it's something she's terrified of. And here's a perfect world where no one has any problems and no one wants to listen to her. And that's just another aspect of like her world becoming unreal. Everything here is like an objective impossibility, but she's constantly being told, well, you know, everyone's happy. So, you know, this should, this should be real, right? Don't you think so? Um, sorry. <laughs> Um, we look at the framework of Rika's actions against Satoko, um, and it reminds me again of like how the victim of bullying, we mentioned this, uh, has the greatest backlash. Uh, Rika talks back to Hanyu and criticizes her, and Hanyu twists her words and literally is like, you're a coward, you're not trying to fight. Um, I'm like a mother to you, but Hanyu has always acted like a dependent and bratty little sister. There's been no point in 100 years, it seems like, where Hanyu acted like she was a guardian figure to Rika. And now here she is like dismissing her and 
saying that she's a coward for not choosing her own fate because Rika is overwhelmed and alone, <laughs> which is also like, she just doesn't seem to care or understand Rika's pain. She is utterly alien to her. I read a lot here. I apologize. Don't apologize. No, it's, it's good. good. It's great. Um, it's making me think about stuff too. Like I remember, oh yeah, my mom also gaslit me. Cool. Mm, it's uh, if you need a minute though, to just like <sighs> calm down. That's perfectly fine as well. Uh, I, I'm in a good mood. I'm just, this is definitely something that gets me incensed, but I enjoy talking about it. Um, let me see here. I noted that Rika can only relate to and care about Satoko when, and, I quote, when she has been through the worst of anyone. Uh, Rika describes like Satoko as someone she loves because she is a good person who tries very hard because she knows what it's like to have been through those things. And she doesn't want other people to go through those things. I would mention like the fact that Satoko plays pranks on people not to hurt them, but because she knows it diffuses a serious situation. It helps diffuse when someone is nervous. She does it out of a shared affection and th this hope of kind of like being able to speak to someone when she herself does not have like the language or maturity always to express that. But you can see her trying there, whereas here she's... Like, this is just a bully. This is a, a Satoko who paradoxically never experienced any abuse, which is I incredibly strange. And it's no wonder Rika hates this Satoko. And I think this proves just how codependent Satoko's relationship, I'm sorry, Rika's relationship was with Satoko. Because I, I, f I already felt this way from like Mina Goroshi. Rika's projecting her own experiences onto Satoko. And the only way that Rika feels that she can be saved is if Satoko is saved. But this is a Satoko that doesn't need her and a Satoko that doesn't understand her pain, which, because it's like Rika has a very absurdist trauma. It's like her uh, trauma is like this abstracted allegory rather than like something grounded and noticed like uh, Satoko being like physically abused and uh, regularly like uh, emotionally abused. And Rika being able to sort of like project this onto Satoko gives it a body. It gives it something that makes her feel like she can exist in the world. And I think you can see that with all of her different friends, like these people seeing how they're people, seeing how they struggle. These are the things that make her hang on. These are the things that make her keep trying to live a better life and trying to save them as people because she knows the best of who they can be. And in this world, if they're supposed to be the best of who they can be, but they're still mistreating her and finding it fun to treat anyone in this way, why should this world give her any hope or happiness, right? Mm. Yeah. And like, and that to me feeds into her depersonalization because she no longer feels like she's a real person because Satoko is nothing more than a bully. Like Rika becoming alone in her trauma and suffering, she becomes less than. She becomes someone who cannot ask for help. She cannot become someone who can reach out her hand. Even when supposedly Satoshi and Reina are like reaching out their hands, they're telling her, oh, well, you know, you can gather the cups of the fragments together, the, the fragments of the cup together, but they're just fragments. Once it breaks, it can't go back to the way it was. Just look for another cup. And the whole point of Matsuri Bayashi was Rika chose to collect those broken fragments and put them back together. And she made something beautiful of that. She took what was broken and she did her best to heal it, not just for herself, but all of her friends. And so them saying that is like it's spitting in the face of all of her efforts and her care and concern for others. The concern that she took even for Takano, right? Mm. <laughs> uh, it's like she has no opportunities to look for another cup. Like Hanyu saying that Rika ever had a choice to me is insane considering she doesn't. She has a choice in terms of like the immediate of what she does, but then she always dies. She can't look for another world very easily. And even when she makes choices, like she doesn't know necessarily how they'll come out. She's been failed. She's been betrayed so many times. And it's, 
I, I just find it to be horrifying. Um, I quoted Rika here saying, If I could forget about the other worlds that would represent my death, I would gradually forget losing my grasp on the world which I had lived in. Only I had the luxury of being a special case and jumping between destinies at a whim. And I find this horrifying because none of Rika's fragment hopping was done at a whim. It was centered around her death. She, like, like I said, she had no choice. Choosing between having to wholly repress her memories for the convenience of others or being able to live as herself and the personality she built alongside the trauma, that's her only choice. Um, Rika, like, uh, yeah, and Sudoku, she was inspired by her. Um, Rika says, it was Rika Ferude's right, not mine, to enjoy going home with them. Uh, she's blaming herself and project placing herself as someone undeserving of joy because of trauma and rejection. I'm repeating some of the things Jan said. I apologize, Jan. Um, I'll never forgive you ever. <laughs> I know. And Doomed. the last major thing I wrote in this document here, uh, Rika says, if I was hit again, would I vanish and the pure Rika of this world return? And I noted that um, purity is an idea oftentimes pushed onto victims, particularly victims of sexual assault. We had previously discussed like um, the very intrusive and violent deaths Rika went through have like this tone of sexual assault. This Rika is pure and didn't go through anything bad and therefore she's more deserving. Burn Castle is an impure person, someone who cannot enjoy little things, someone who cannot be a good friend, someone who is inherently harmful to those around her. It's it's almost as if like because she is here, she is adding sin to the world. She is the reason this world is not sinless because she exists. If Burn Castle asks like Rika, then her mother won't be cruel and controlling. If she's nice to her bullies, then they won't take action around against her. If she represses herself in her hurt, she'd never be hurt again. But we understand that that is an inherent fallacy. And that's all I had in this part of the document with the dissociation and struggles. <laughs> that was really good. Thank you. Thank you. It's yeah. I was going to say like, this is, <laughs> can you just like, take everything you just said and and make like a like just a just turn it into a video essay and bam <laughs> like it's right <laughs> here it, it's right here there was yeah this is all incredibly insightful and useful and again adds so much context needed necessary context for not only Sakuroshi but the 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 whole of Higurashi so I'm glad you think so. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, and then fascism.mp3 starts playing for some weird reason. <laughs> it knows. <laughs> it knows. I don't know what it knows, but it knows something. But yeah, all I was gonna say was that um, the about the freak uh, the the freaka hopping is what uh, the fragment <laughs> the Rika fragment hopping freaka. That's what I. We have Grana, and now we have Frika. <laughs> Uh, I was just gonna say, like, isn't that also just like correcting the uh, like Hanyu's like original sin? Yeah, like, it's all her fault. It's all her fault. She did it, <laughs> so, and then she felt bad. And uh, anyway, but yeah, I can't think. Uh, <laughs> Fascism. Mb3. All right, I'm skipping it. Anyway, uh, okay. Did uh, uh, Olo? You haven't yes. talked in a while. <laughs> yes. Oh, you had a uh, talk here too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> the phrasing I put um, was there is something so gender about identity issues and feeling like you've betrayed your younger self. Uh, <laughs> I'm like going to try and see if I can um, build on that a little. Um, I tend to read a lot of things in a specifically like a trans uh, reading um, just because. I'm trans. I think about my gender a lot. Uh, I think about the relation of my gender to also my younger self. Like, uh, the way that I think of my, my own shit is that, like, I was a, like, a, a little girl. And at some point, around, like, 12 or so, uh, I stopped being a girl. And now I am no longer a girl. I'm a boy thing something. <laughs> I'm something. Uh, You're old. <laughs> to go with boy. Yeah, I'm Olo. Um, but yeah, like, I was just reading some of um, Rika's things about, like, um, yeah, the, the Rika fruity of this world. Like, I've been doing no more than... Uh, sorry, I'm trying to find 
where she puts it. Yeah. When I think like that, regardless of whether she's been having happy days or not, I feel like I've done something awful to the Truda de Rica of this world. Naturally, it's too late to apologize now. After all, I can't even return this body to Truda de Rica anymore. And it's a, <laughs> it's a thing of depending, like everything with trans shit always is like just very personal from one person to another and uh like i consider myself pretty lucky in that um in that i had like fairly supportive parents uh there was some strife but like i wasn't in danger of like losing a, a roof over my head or anything like that mm -hmm. um but it was also just this this struggle within myself to come to terms with who i am and trying to project that out onto the world as well. And also, uh, lately, <laughs> it's been really scary to just sort of be myself in public. But um, but it's that thing where like you'll get into moments where you'll look back onto who you used to be before, like it's sort of the idea of like looking back at who you were before trauma happened. Because while I, I consider my my environment pretty okay, transitioning like starting to transition was like super traumatic because it's just this thing of like i'm a, <laughs> i'm a teenager everything is like 10 times more explosive and terrible than normal i barely understand what i am i'm trying to fight to express who i am i'm <laughs> under threat of law already at like when i can't even drive and it's it's just a, a thing of like so much shit was going on and still is going on and it sucks to be a trans person in general right now but like but at the same time like there'll be times when it it's just like a shitty day and i look back and i'll feel like if i wasn't like this if i was how i was when i was like 12 before i thought about this stuff maybe i could have been happier or maybe I feel like I might have like ruined that person. I feel like like a thing of like once you start changing your body, it's like I feel like I've ruined my body for this person. I feel like I've ruined this person. Like I I've buried my old self and I've like killed them. I've done this horrible thing to who I used to be. But but at the same time it's a thing of like you have to not <laughs> It's easy to say, but like you have to try and not let yourself fall into that because it sort of like thinking about, oh, what would I have been if I didn't go through this awful thing? It's like, that's not going to help. It's a thing of you are changed by, by life, by time, by everything. And yeah, you just have to try and live with that change and find the goodness to find the goodness in your life and learn to forgive yourself and learn to see that your younger self doesn't hate you. It's a thing of like forgiving yourself, forgiving your younger self and having your younger self forgive you. It's, it's just this very messy thing. But mm -hmm. yeah, like the, the idea of Rika, like ruining of, of Burncastel ruining Rika's life and ruining this Rika's life was very, it hit me really hard where it's like, Oh, Oh, I know that. I know how that is. <laughs> Well, thank you for sharing. That is, um, yeah, very, very good, uh, very, uh, important, um, mm -hmm. to consider. And, um, yeah, no, it's, it's very, um, insightful. And, um, yeah, I think, I think everybody can relate. Um, yeah, it's, yeah. <laughs> no notes. <laughs> I got nothing. Um, but yeah, thank you again for sharing. Um, did uh, someone else want to? Uh, was there were there more people on this topic? Looks like Jan, you had some stuff early on, or did you already um, talk about? Um, I think I pretty much. Honestly, I think I pretty much got everything. Uh, just like little things, like I uh, tone and brevity, for instance. Not really much to say here. I just thought it was really interesting how this was a really short one. 
and really pulled its punches on terms of like showing brutality like we're used to seeing didn't go into that and that's like okay neat doesn't usually do that it did it i think it was for the better cool that it went in this way <clears throat> that's you know <laughs> that's pretty much all everything else i had to say about it just neat okay now um I guess we can move on to scapegoating and gaslighting. All right. Who's ready to scapegoat and gaslight? <laughs> Those are my favorite things to do. <laughs> uh, I have stuff to say. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. Hey, hey, Talzreal. Yo. Would you like to talk about scapegoating and gaslighting? And girl bossing, <laughs> assuming, assumedly? Uh, I'm probably the worst one to ha have this section because I was the most sympathetic to Han Yu for this particular point since we're talking about what ha I mean, uh, it starts with uh, Jan talking about what um, uh, what Re what happened to Rika as she woke up from uh, woke up in back in the Matsuri Bayashi timeline in the Irie clinic after. <clears throat> after living in the quote sinless world and i mean my first read was that i mean Han Yu comes out oh yeah it was a dream and i mean it, it kind of goes in multiple directions my first read was that it was um an attempt to cushion her return to matsuri bayashi because she had to kill her mother and presumably also herself to get back here and uh my first read was that it was softening the blow, but at the same time, if it was all a dream, Hanyu's doing a remarkably competent job acting out the um, acting out the concern, or and um, the later bit about um, uh, about being uh, about not being happy about losing out on the cream puff she was promised in the other world. Um, if uh, under the dream interpretation, she's doing a really go good job of acting as if as if everything was real and not this dream lesson like we've all found evidence that it probably was. You know, I kind of feel like she was cushioning it, but not in a constructive way, more in terms of don't express your discomfort. Stop feeling it right now. She, she literally does the fucking like brain suffocation, just like yeah. pulling the negativity out of her. And that felt less like it was for her sake and more to be like, I don't want to deal with this. I don't want you to have to acknowledge your pain. Just shove that back down and go back to being happy. I mean, remember, like, yeah, she was pushing it, but not by letting her express her emotions. And remember, that's that's represented by Rika, like gasping for air, like mm -hmm. after Hanyu does it. It's like clearly not a good thing. And if, you know, Hanyu were to continue to do it, presumably Rika would suffocate. So it's like, you know, and in think uh, extrapolating from that. Yeah, this is kind of a suffocation of that aspect of her. So, yeah. That totally tracks. Han you hate never stops. <laughs> we hate we hate Han you in here. Han you hate train. <laughs> it's I departing the station. Her, we're gonna do the dog shaming meme from several years ago, but for Han you. <laughs> Just hang a fucking paper board around her neck that says, I locked my kind of daughter into a hellhole time impossible time to teach her an object lesson she didn't need to learn i love the i love the idea of rika being the representative like of a dog and then uh, in, in a in a um <laughs> in a car with all the windows up and it's just han you ass han you like locking the dog uh, rika in the hot car and just being like she's fine it's fine i'm just gonna go into the into the um in the store real quick i'll be right out I don't know if that metaphor tracks. Anyway. Boy, Shiro's song was hot car. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> oh, if she's God. hot, you're hot. <laughs> favorite music. It's perfect music. All right. Who would like to go next talking on. about this? What's that? The AC is not on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry to cut you off, by the way. Are, are you all done with yours or is there anything else you want to say? Oh, me? No. I, that was about all I had. 
I, I just I had to shut it down with more homie. I'm so sorry. <laughs> All my homies hate on you. Nope. Clear to move on to the next uh, point. I have mixed feelings on Hanyu. <laughs> Uh, would anyone like to take it, or should I just uh, call someone out at random? Uh, we are still in the scapegoating and gaslighting uh, topic. Looks like the uh, folks who have stuff in here are Yawn and Gail and Olo. Olo, yep. Olo, you're up. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Um, I wasn't sure if this would be like its own, if I should make this its own, but I decided to tack it on here. But just the... Yeah, going back to the idea of the the sinless world, quote unquote, and tying it into like a the sort of like <laughs> I would say self inflicted, but I guess it's Hanyu inflicted guilt slash martyr complex. The idea that like a world where nothing bad happens is also a world where Rika is isolated and sort of being made or making herself into a scapegoat for the sake of her friends and like um talk about it in a different thing but i'll just tie it in here like this um i think it's kind of a tendency of like children who get lonely because i i became a lonely child pretty early on um where like you'll tend to kind of justify feeling like shit by saying like oh yeah actually you know what this place sucks i, I don't care that i'm lonely everyone here is stupid they stink i don't want to be friends with anyone here anyway or to the extent of like Oh, maybe it's a good thing that no one talks to me because I'm so terrible. I just make everyone sad and like a uh, kind of like ruining things and sort of like depending on how things shake out for you, it can either be a thing of like, I'm lonely because I don't care about these people or I'm lonely and isolated because I care so much about these people that I don't want to inflict myself upon them kind of thing. But yeah, and like, I feel like Rika is going through, I feel like she's kind of having a, a a mix of it where it's like these are not my real friends these aren't the people i care about but also like it's clear that even though they they aren't her friends she still cares about her friends and also like she the i'm thinking about when she's telling herself that it it actually doesn't hurt her heart that she's attacking uh sadako where it's like <laughs> that that brings me back to what I went through where like where I tried to bite my friend where it's like for completely unrelated reasons to this friend like just something was like pissing me off and I don't even remember what it was I was just like full of child rage and it's like at some point you just sort of direct it somewhere and my friend was just there so it's like a and like I I haven't tried to justify it to myself other than like I was a kid and like I didn't know how to control my emotions but I see that like Rika is like kind of justifying it to herself and like no actually this Sadako doesn't matter this is one this one isn't real I don't care that she looks like Sadako it doesn't hurt me that I'm hurting her it, it's fine it's fine actually it's good that I'm lonely it's good that I have no friends because I need to do work and find a way back to my real friends kind of thing yeah I think that tracks big agree on swing alrighty uh, would we uh, uh, you want to toss up Jan and Gail I think yeah. anything else would be like an elaboration of what we've already said I think we've really covered that like do you think there's anything else we haven't said about this Gail do you think uh, there's anything else we could add let me see I kind of mentioned this, but I think there's a sense of guilt and jealousy that Hanyu feels that Rika was able to allow her mother to die and feel no grief for it. Um, putting Rika through the same thing she needlessly put her own daughter through. Uh, Hanyu, I feel, represents a deep sense of modern conservatism in Japan and the way that it burns itself into new victims. I quoted the part where Rika calls Hanyu a coward. You're going to force me to dirty my hands while never dirtying yours. Convenient, isn't it? You can blame it all on one person. Nobody else will be marked with sin. I'm the perfect human sacrifice. Um, and I say it's terrifying because Hanyu is throwing Rika's pronouncements from the end of Matsuri Bayashi in her face. Rika made a point to say that she wanted a world where no one had to be the scapegoat. No one had to be the human 
sacrifice, not herself, to Kano or Hanyu. Hanyu presents a world, however, where it's unavoidable and the human sacrifice is Rika's own mother. It's incongruous and actively gaslighting Rika into sharing this perception, even though Rika's experience is vastly different from Hanyu's. Uh, and and then I also mentioned, like, she, Rika may criticize Hanyu, but Hanyu has complete power over her in this scenario. But yeah, we hate Hanyu. Hanyu hate squad never stops. <laughs> never stops. Can't stop, won't stop. All right, uh, moving on to uh, Furude mother daughter relationships. Uh, I think we pretty much got that too. Oh, uh, okay. Um, Talzreel, do you feel that we uh, covered that uh, to I your? Think that, I think my segment might uh, take a little more consideration. Just um, uh, there's oh, the sorry, point. Yeah. Um, I mean, yes. Yeah, as far as Jan's section being covered, that's perfectly fair. But um, for my part, um, we see a lot more warmth from Mrs. Ferrude in this arc, but it's a lot more hollow than the um, than Mrs. Ferrude in the normal time. Normal Mrs. Ferrude is high strung, but she, in that high strung uh, personality, she is trying to defend her daughter from exploitation by Takano and the clinic. She's just not aware of that Rika is aware of the costs and benefits of what she's getting into and probably couldn't understand even if Rika really did try to lay it out. Meanwhile, the quote-unquote sinless Mrs. Ferrude is co coldly goes around telling her to do her homework and isn't really engaging with her until the doctor uh, comes back and reports, Hey, your daughter is cracking up. Your daughter is dangerously unstable. Uh, I've got the other point that um, Hanyu, as a Ferrude matriarch, would have kind of personal reasons to take exception to uh, Rika discarding her own mother to save Satoko from Hinamizawa syndrome by discarding Mrs. Furude and her dad to ensure that the clinic has enough space to develop the treatments to, uh, to treat Satoko. But uh, at the same time, a lot of that is Hanyu's fault because one of the early breakouts was Rika learned things from Hanyu that Mrs. Prude never taught her, and she freaks out over Rika doing those things. And um, she's also, um, with the succession of the queendom, that the village is focusing on Rika as, the, as their idol now, as opposed to her as... The, just emotional stress points that uh, that sort of inform, lead into the abuse she does because she doesn't understand her daughter and she lashes out about. It. Yeah, there is an interesting aspect of this where uh, viewing it from uh, viewing this um, the majority of this arc as the the brainchild of Hanyu. Um, it's interesting Han Yu being a mother, um, how she would like sort of view and extrapolate her feelings, uh, probably very self-serving, um, uh, uh, overly nice feelings of, uh, a mother and putting that onto, um, um, Rika's mom. And so basically, you know, uh, she's kind of changing the script, kind of like what Gail was saying, uh, saying earlier. Yeah, I think that's that's an incredibly <laughs> like uh, interesting. Yeah, she's using her as a proxy. Yeah, and so it's incredibly fucked up considering yeah all the uh, shitty shit that she did earlier. Yeah, no, it's yeah, it's stuff that you know. In the moment, I think I uh, was like kind of, kind of like viewing her with like you know without any kind of without any kind of question. Uh, but now like going over all of this history and actually like digging deep into it, it's like, Oh no. Uh, yeah, no, she pretty much sucked, uh, like across the fucking board. So, uh, fuck. Anyway, I think I gave her yeah, too I much really, credit. I think I'm trying to say, I really feel like with that, 
it was like she saw Rika not getting all that upset that her mom dies every single time. And he's like, but, but, but I wanted my daughter to be upset about me. Why aren't you getting upset about your mom? Yeah. And then she's like using this basically as a proxy to handle her own insecurities. <laughs> exactly. Totally. Yeah. 1000%. Wow. Is it like, um, yeah, I would say like a lot of this kind of uh, maybe didn't fly over my head, but I was like taking it a little more, um, I guess, literally or like uh, I wasn't seeing it, but like I, I see it now in this discussion. And I, I think part of it is like also just like um, Hanyu is like a, a cute design. So even though I know all these things about her, Whenever I like see what she does, I'm just like, oh yeah, Hanyu, that funny little dog, you know that. <laughs> ow, ow. That, that funny little anime girl, and then you think about it a little more, and it's like, oh wait, she's got depth. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. And she's kind of a <laughs> shitty person. She's flawed. Yeah. Totally. Mm -hmm. At the same time, it's kind of interesting on that level that um, Hanyu is a mother, but she appears as a. I mean she manifests as a peer to um rika, to rika. Yeah. she she looks like she's on age with rika and satoko rather than manifesting as something like uh the like the age she would have died at or or her prime otherwise yeah it's like her existence is like kind of a contradiction um of her own design which is funny to me it's like no, I I know I know I'm I know I'm contradicting myself. I know, I'm cool with it though. I'm God, and never and we're all in the rafters being like, but fuck you though. <laughs> you fucking suck though. Anyway, no, just we're all throwing like <laughs> tomatoes at this at this uh, dog God. Anyway, <laughs> we we really are. Speaking of dog God. Uh, would we like to talk about Sekiroshi as the dog ending? Is that a I thing? I thought we did that. Uh, no. No, we didn't. No, we we didn't. You know it. why? No. Because this music hasn't factored in yet. Oh. Wait, no, that's not the music. Hold on. That was anticlimactic. <laughs> that sucks. Here we go. Loop. Yes. Here we go. We're all just listening to the music now. That's, <laughs> that's it. That's the rest of it. Oh, would anyone like to talk? Uh, Gail, did you talk? Uh, did, did you mention that you wanted to expound on the dog Yay. ending? Yay. Okay. All right. So I was thinking about the dog ending. So this will probably require a little bit of context for my thoughts with regards to Silent Hill 2 um, in terms of its approach to the dog ending. Um, obviously, it's a joke, um, which, you know, that's totally fine. Really enjoy that. But what do you mean? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but I what I think is very interesting is a represent, like I said here, a representation of futility and horror, and the fact that horror and comedy are very heavily interlinked, like tragedy, like you know, tragic comedy and everything else. The way that those play into like stage and other qualities, it, Silent Hill Two is presenting that quite literally as if the entire story was on a. Uh, a stage as if it was like on a sound set and whatnot. And Ryukishi himself has a very big background in theater and plays, and that's the first thing that he had wanted to do in the first place. Saikoroshi feels more than anything like that kind of play setup. And when we're kind of engaging with it from that perspective of this being a comedy uh, or a tragic comedy that Hani was putting Rika through and sort of like the personal horror that she takes at it. Like w when you kind of like look at the, the dog ending and the way that James is kind of like, it was all you're doing and he just falls over to his knees and then the dog just kind of like comes over and it's just like, uh -huh, I'm a dog. Um, I can really kind of look at that and lean into that as this quality of seeing the fact that people view your struggles as comedy. They don't take it seriously. They don't see it as anything but the potential for their own amusement. And their Rika cannot really guarantee or tell how it is that Hanyu feels about her because all of Hanyu's actions within this are like 
absurdist. They don't make sense. It, it literally is this fragmentation of a reality that could not exist. And obviously, like the dog ending, you know, that can't really exist because like a dog can't do that. But how are we to say that when everything else within Silent Hill 2 is this abstracted sense of trauma and horror? So Hanyu kind of like putting her through this and this idea of like controlling Rika's pain and trauma, controlling her world, controlling what gives and takes away her happiness are just these questions of how this can kind of reflect that idea of the tragic comedy of the dog ending. And also just sort of like the fact that it completely takes away from Rika's personal experience and negates kind of like the potential of her own ending. Um, but yeah, that's that's my thoughts on it. Hope you enjoy me trying to analyze the dog ending. Gail? Gail, I... I'm extremely impressed that you managed to get genuine thoughtful analysis out of what was in my case a shit post comparing Saikiroshi to the dog ending purely on the basis of both having kind of malicious dog masterminding things behind the scenes that's yeah. that's all i meant by it but and i'm yeah. <laughs> i'm I, you can I, analyze I'm, anything given the I, right perspective. Yeah, I, I, In I this case, it's just a complete death of the author, because obviously they just mean it as a joke. There's no I, real I, yeah. potential beyond the fact that I chose to reframe the idea of the dog ending and generally Gale. that conceit. Gail, you are a miracle of a person. You're wonderful to be around. <laughs> that I that was There's wonderful. no sarcasm here. You're just incredible. I... You deserve the world. The entire world developed by a dog. It's very true. Is Gale a dog? Again. <gasps> do God is dog. Backwards. <gasps> That's so fucked up. Ow, 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 ow. <laughs> Olo, what, was your, what were you saying, Olo? Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> the... You analyzing the dog ending like this. Great. Like, incredible. I love it. It's also making me think, and I haven't watched the whole video, I just, like, know what happens, but it's making me think of the Lasagna Cat episode where the guy, like, talked for a full hour about that single Garfield I've comment. seen that several times. It is perfect. The first Garfield I love, strip. I, yep. love, I love fucking media analysis. It fucking rules. This is awesome. <laughs> It's Le so much fun. Also, I always get, like, people, is just are always, people are always <laughs> surprised that I can like do critical analysis with Neil Breen movies, and it's just like, well, I mean, oh, they're fascinating. There's so much I I can say. You can do critical analysis of anything, even things yeah. that have no thought put into them. Because it yeah, says something about I'm... the person and the culture that they made it in. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'm just really impressed that I had one joke in mind and you were able to use that as a jumping off point for meaningful analysis yeah. you're really you're talented you're incredible if you put, if really you put something in front of me i will take that as a challenge That's i have thrown you a little tiny piece of bread <laughs> and you made a mountain out of it you made a house out of this bread no. You see numbers. You even positing this joke says a lot about you and uh, it does. your cultural background. My cultural background is that I like Higurashi and Silent Hill. <laughs> Yay. And that dogs are funny. And guess and what? I think dogs, dogs are really funny. And guess what? Now I do too. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> Woo! Higurashi and Silent Hill fan Bob reporting for duty. Uh, yeah. <laughs> fuck God and Hanyu. <laughs> and like and dog. Say. I think <laughs> exactly. Heather would also hate on you. Oh well, it depends on which Heather you're Heather talking about. You're talking about bad ending. The confessional. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, bad ending Heather is just sort of like completely out of character individual that's uh, torturing us for thinking that we could ever dare to have a control over a young woman who is simply trying to escape her greatest trauma. <laughs> Maybe she is Hanyu. She feels mm. she should feel no guilt, unlike James, who should feel lots of guilt. <laughs> <laughs> he did oh, crime. The 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 people who love the leave ending of Silent Hill Two, we need to talk. <laughs> <laughs>
Oh my god. Anyways. Much to say. What's that? There's much to say there's, about video games. There's so much to say. And so many people who refuse to say it. I'm but not here! I'm gonna we'll say something say wild. We want. Uh, would the thing that you're saying be um, hurt or amplified by me continue, continuing to have the dog ending uh, song playing on loop? Amplified. Okay, go for it. Uh, I really like Rebirth. Yeah, Rebirth is I fun. Think that's a, I think that's like a really interesting one to think about, like thematically. Rebirth is totally fun. I, I, my, my thing is also like not only leave like there's a discussion to be had there, but for me it's also anyone who thinks that there's like a canon ending, no, like they, the, the I, people I, who are like, oh, in water no. is like, you know, the the one is like, you I, are completely missing the point of I, like I really, media, like in general. So I, I no, really Ludo narrative. It's really I really good disagree too. with yeah. I really disagree with there being a canonical ending at all. Like that just. I don't like that. Guys, it turns um, out we don't like, uh, I, I, I hate to say it, but do we, do we disagree with Masahiro Ito? Yes. I disagree with him about a lot of things and, uh, I'm not sure we should talk about that thing. Yeah, let's not. Okay. Yeah, I got really upset earlier after, Me too. unfortunately. Oh, no worries. No worries. Yeah. yeah um, I, I, I love and respect upset. everyone here. No worries. Yeah. Same. I, love and respect. It, um, it made me upset. <laughs> All right, let's move past it. I, I was just making a cheeky joke. Uh, yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. But yeah, no, no more of that. No more of that. Um, so, uh, yeah, is that it? Is that is that uh, most no. of it, or should we talk about the final one? Is responsibility and cruelty of writers? Uh, okay. Was by Gail. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh no, <laughs> she's got Henry <laughs> Sauer syndrome. <laughs> uh, okay. Well. So when I first uh, finished Saikoroshi, I was really upset and stressed, and it made me really upset. Like, and um, I couldn't really think about it uh, because I was really, really upset. Um, so the first thing I had to do was look at it through a meta perspective as Ryukishi uh, engaging with it as a writer. Um, so basically, I, I note, I think that this is the first truly meta textual thing that Ryukishi has written. This is a story about writing stories. Like Rika is someone who can look at different worlds outside on her own. Hanyu is the creator of Rika's many lives and experiences and the guilt therein. Questioning what makes a character more of a character. Um, again, I come back to uh, the Rena of the other world you talked about probably isn't as human as this Rena is. You thought I was an exemplary person in that dream, but when I was actually Rena, I was not a respectable person. This notation is really interesting because Reina is emphasizing the idea of humanity. I think it has an important context at other levels as well, but this is something that I feel like is engaged with as the personal struggle of a writer making characters. Like, do I have to make the characters in my story suffer for readers to care about them? Is there suffering what makes them good? Is there suffering what makes them palatable? Or would removing the hard edges make them boring or easy or simple? Would people like them less? Would people be less interested? in my story. Reina within Rika's dream is ostensibly the same kind of person, very nice and pleasant, but she cannot be a person to us because she only exists within the what if of a writer's mind. Does that make it less meaningful? Does it make the worst story? We don't know. Ryuki, she doesn't either. And I, I really find that fascinating because Rika herself is she is both sort of a stand-in for Ryukishi, as well as Ryukishi like engaging with that, like, when perhaps would my character become a different character? He views his characters as kind of like actors or uh, just players on a stage who are placed into different roles on a chessboard, I guess you could say. And he can twist them and try to make them in doing different things while still keeping them in character. But I'm sure it's a concern of his to kind of see this quality of twisting his own character so much that they're no longer recognizable as that person. So when he's sort of engaging with this Rika who didn't go through anything versus this Rika who is now inhabiting this body and trying to live within this world, and you see all of these other characters that are supposed to be the same person, but don't seem right, don't seem like they would be. 
he's really, I think, targeting himself and challenging himself to understand why those people, why these interpretations of these characters are not who he, are not like his goal for his writing. If that makes sense? I think yeah, so. Yeah, I think so. Okay. Um, and then I kind of went on here. I mentioned this a little bit earlier. Um, this also to me stands as an exploration of how to have or make and write a happy ending. Uh, of course, Ryukishi was pondering at the end of Matsuri Bayashi um, because he said this ending for the series isn't the best possible ending. He was like, if you can think of a better ending, I'd love to hear it. And I find that Saikaroshi is like he is criticizing himself for trying to think that he could make a truly perfect ending because there isn't a perfect ending. There is no black and white perspective on that. Even in this beautiful world, maybe someone sent him a letter being like, well, what if there is a world where nothing bad happened to the characters? And he's like, well, it sucks. It, it's like, that's the whole point in um, Matsuri Bayashi is that there is no such thing as a sinless world. And all we can do is forgive each other and include one another. But Rika is being explicitly like non-included as a character here. And she herself is kind of turning herself into a writer figure who is unable to actually figure out what would make a better ending to this story. Like, how can she make a true ending to her story? How can this be a... How can she ensure that this was the right choice? And th that's something that comes up repeatedly throughout the very ending epilogue for this part. But that is himself, I believe, Ryukishi thinking. There, are, He has no way to make everyone happy. And that's not just about his characters. That's about his readers. That's about people who reach out to him. They say, hey, I hated this ending. And he's just like, well, I, I wanted you to love it. I love the story. But how can I make someone love something or makes it to where someone isn't disappointed? There is no way. And I also kind of finished this out saying, like, maybe Ryukishi's even thinking, is it rude to survivors of trauma to say that level of happiness is the best that they can achieve? Or is it more rude to say to the survivors that they simply need to remove themselves from the world, that a world without suffering or scapegoating means they themselves have to learn when to remove themselves? And I think there's that sort of like multi-level struggle of his in the text where it's just him constantly challenging himself. He is both Rika and Hanyu. He's criticizing the fate that Rika has been put into because the fate that Rika has put into is what he put her into when he started writing the story. Um, the fate that he pulled his readers into, the fate that he put himself within. And I just think that's interesting. Okay. Yeah, it's definitely more fuel for my fire about the read of um, Hanyu being... Uh, stand in for the audience because yeah. especially in this chapter it's like mm -hmm. I mean that's literally what <laughs> we already talked about it but this is literally just the Hanyu fan fiction so <laughs> it, yeah it definitely reads um, in that way so I would hate her fanfic it's very true <laughs> part of me wants to segue this into a discussion about the ending of Danganronpa V3 but I feel like that also requires people to know the ending to Danganronpa V3 to really talk I about. I have very interesting feelings about that ending but also you know um, I know plenty of people didn't play that because it's Danganronpa and you have to get through a lot of shit to get to that ending. <laughs> mm -hmm. But um, yeah Danganronpa V3's ending for those who don't know is an, also a very much an author talking about the effect his work has had and like the meanings his characters have on the greater world and it's uh boy is that a more cynical take of what uh rikishi has here yeah i'm I, just I gonna it's very interesting though so hmm. i'm just Ask gonna it. say i love all of you i love the book clubs i love higurashi <laughs> i'm having a great time <laughs> i'm what? just a <laughs> little bit winded by now. Yeah, my my butt yeah. hurts. Left in me. <laughs> my been, ass is on fire. On five hours. <laughs> I'm sorry. I can talk too much. That's my problem. Um, Gail... I become insane and manic, and then I explode. 
<laughs> Gail, you're, you're the best. <laughs> yes. Ursula Cat, I love you too. <laughs> Ursula Cat's been in the chat the whole time. God I know, damn. I love all of Ursula's chat. Like Ursula mm. Cat's like chats. I don't know. C come join the actual voice chat. Come on. Loser. Yeah. Uh, FYI, I they've done that before. Everybody's but... uh, everybody's invited. Um, just I FYI, might just be you, up the cats. <laughs> you know, we don't want to don't want to like make you feel like you have to or anything, and you know, or on the spot or anything. But the it's open. Like you just come to the the Discord, j hop in the chat, and then we just talk. Um, and that um, goes for everybody. So. Uh, uh, if you want to. Also, I just want to call out GX Suit for correctly identifying R of Can, which <laughs> I, I was like, I don't know why, but I read uh, like right before you said that, I looked at the title of the song and I was like, what a what a weird name for a song. And then of course, <laughs> GX Suit's like it's fucking calling something. it. What's that? Yeah, that's me. I was just oh, shit. saying I, I was just thinking yeah. out loud, going, I wonder if it, um, I wonder if it's a reference to something. R of can. No. Roll of a can? Uh, I don't know. I it's mean, a lot of probably means something. Like they are playing on a can, so I, I, I figured that was about it. R can. <laughs> okay, now I guess uh, now that we're relatively done with the doc, we, overall thoughts on Psychoroshi just before, or Higurashi in general, actually. Since this oh, is man. Um, I was actually going to talk to y'all about potentially doing another um, stream where we can sort of split it into two where we can split it into like basically overall Higurashi feels um, the beginning of it being like the non-spoiler version and then the ending being the heavily spoilered version, or we can do the spoilered version now and just kind of get it out. But um, as numbers correctly pointed out uh, pain, uh, I am literally in pain. My fucking ass is <laughs> on fire. Uh, my tailbone is jutting out of my, um, I don't want to get too graphic. Anyway. Oh man. You should get that looked oh, at, no. man. Ow. Ow. Let's, I'm let's worried. Talk, let's uh, probably stop here before Bob gets a hernia. Uh, <laughs> I have, I have a great time doing all of these book club streams, but I think this one might be my favorite. I don't know why. Uh, I love them all, um, in their own way. <laughs> this I one them was all. great. This one was great. Except for the ones which I wasn't in, which are the worst ones and unwatchably <laughs> bad. Oh, I, I'm lying. I'm lying. I'm lying. Sure, They're great. I'm sure. Sure, you are sure. I, yeah. Okay. What are you believe. implying by that? Are you alluding that I actually have a grudge against them? Come yeah, on, man. Uh -huh. Come on. Sure. <laughs> anyway. I don't. I promise. All right. Um. So yeah, we're gonna call it. Um. Uh, I'm also debating playing another one of the side arcs, and we might want to talk about that um i forget the name of it but i also want to go she yeah you yeah, go she and then maybe i'll do another one like I, i'm really interested in the the thing that started all of this which was hinami's bus stop um, oh yeah I'm really beyond is it strong <laughs> it's kind of a mess <laughs> it's kind of a mess <laughs> oh, i'm sure yeah um i don't think i've read bus stop that would be a new one for me yeah i haven't either but yeah, um, keep posted. Uh, I'm. I think we'll. I think we'll do it. I think the vibes are good. I think that it's. It'll be a good idea. So yeah, um, stay tuned for. I know this is supposed to be the final, final finale, but no, it turns out there's going to be a final, final, final finale. And uh, yeah, keep post for, posted for that. I want to thank everybody <laughs> in. Oh, what's that? I just doesn't want to leave Hinamizawa. Uh, apparently <laughs> not. Don't. Here's the problem. You know I that either. You know what happens to people who leave, right? That's <laughs> <laughs> true. Uh, is that intentional? Anyway, uh, <laughs> uh, you know the the thing that happened to people when they saw the first Avatar movie and just uh, uh, the world felt a little uh, more lifeless when they left the theater and they just wanted to go back? I've got that, but for a good piece of media. <laughs> uh, I've been in a perpetual mood to go back to a place called Rokinjima. I've been halfway there through it. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah. yeah. Boy, howdy, do I want to go back? We already have, teeth. we already have the discussion documents set up for those. By the way, oh, fuck <laughs> yes. <laughs> we're already added. We're already adding to those. <laughs> You'll get to uh, Rokenjima. <laughs> politics. Day. I love politics. 
Uh, so much to say. <laughs> how on the table is and then there were none. We were actually uh, talking about it yesterday. Yes, yes, oh, it's yeah. it is very on the table. Um, possibly, possibly as a in between for uh, uh, after. So I'm taking a break um, after probably the next um, book club stream, um, which should be like around when I take my vacation. Because I I'm sorry, I have to finish the medium video. I have to, like I I, I need to get it out of me. <laughs> <laughs> And then you will die. I will. I I can't keep going like this. <laughs> <laughs> Bringing it up randomly in every conversation. I see the medium everywhere. <laughs> it's bad. It's it's a bad place to be. Um. So yeah, I need to get that out. And then yeah, once I come back, or like maybe in the middle of that process, because I got a few other um uh, uh pokers in the fire, um on projects and um. Probably in the middle of that, in between um, when we're done with the official <laughs> final, final um, Igarashi. I'm not. No, I'm not. Ursula Cat, no. Absolutely not. Oh, God. Um, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You said pokers in the fire, and I misheard you. It's, I misheard it's a very different word. And I tried to hold in the laughter, but I cried. I'm I heard, genuinely I, concerned. I heard hookers. <laughs> I'm sorry. I was like, dang, that's a really weird turn of phrase. Oh, I'm sorry. It's not I'm what so I said. sorry. <laughs> I know it is. I want to reiterate that is not what I said. I said, poker. I know. I'm aware. I'm sorry. All right. All right. Um, <laughs> numbers. Sufficient. I just thought you were reacting to what Ursula Cat said. Yeah, I no, did too. I was like, oh, yeah. that's pretty funny. But. <laughs> This really isn't that funny. <laughs> I don't know why it's hitting me. No worries, no worries. Um, but Past yeah. 11, everything's funny. <laughs> it's 1230 over here. Uh, so yeah, um, yeah. We'll, so I think we'll do, uh, and then there were none in between, um, like on our way to Umineko, which again, happening. Um, go on over to bobvids.com, click on, if you're not in the Discord now, click on the Discord button, get in the Discord, Ask for uh, an invite to. <laughs> God damn it, numbers. <laughs> My ass hurts. Please oh, ass hurt. let Done. me finish. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm not doing this on purpose. I just keep cracking. I'm over here in the corner corpsing. I'm sorry. It's just constantly <laughs> bottle dogging. You're you're really bottle dogging it. <laughs> um. So uh. Yeah, so stay tuned. Um, this was really great, and I just want to reiterate. I know we're we're gonna do another one, um, but reiterating, y'all are great. Thank you very very much for joining. I want to thank very very much, Gail. Numbers, who has changed? I, I changed numbers. This oh, okay. Oh, and no, that was that was Kat. That wasn't me. I okay. promise. I was like, oh my God. Uh, death. <laughs> their name is Death by Hookers in the Fire now. Oh God, um, I'm crying laughing. I'm so sorry. It's it wasn't right, that it's funny. Right. It's, it's a good way to end. Uh, thank you very much, Indestructible Cat. Thank you extremely, Olo. Thank you eternally, Talzreel. And thank you fundamentally from the bottom of my soul to Jan. Um, everybody, y'all are fantastic. Thank you for, like, I know <coughs> we're probably going to do another one, but the, fucking... <laughs> That was a cough. I am, <laughs> I'm going to throw so many hookers in the fire. Um, <laughs> uh, but thank you extremely. Like the book clubs wouldn't be the book club without any one of you. So thank you extremely to everybody. Thank you for uh, holding my hand through this journey. And uh, yeah, uh, we're going to do another one, but, and I'll say it again, but it's worth repeating. Thank you extremely and very, very much. And thank you very, very much to everybody in the in the Twitch chat who has been here for fucking five hours. Thank you to everybody who watch, who's watching the VOD. We did it and then some. So y'all are y'all are fantastic. And yeah, onward and upward. Um fuck on you, fuck God. Um yeah. <laughs> Take it easy, y'all. I'm going to sit on some ice. Mm-hmm. I love you all. The fire. <laughs> yeah, because of the fire. Bye bye. <laughs> bye. We enjoyed this. It's always fun. Bye, Vaughn. Awesome. I love you too. Bye, Don't bye, worry. Bye.
Bye, Vod. Bye.